I said, do you love me? She says, no, but that sure is a nice ski mask. <laughs> Are we actually live right now? Oh, nice. How are you, John Henry? I'm pumped. I'm happy. Yeah. Great Feeling to have great. you here. Great to have you here today. We are opening Chested and Cigars. Oh, hey, that's us talking. That's what we look like. Oh, good. If we could just play that so we have a constant echo. Yeah, let's do that. Thing. That'd be super cool. So, how are you? Are we actually live right Is there like a seven second delay yeah. in there? Yeah. So, like, if somebody says something they shouldn't somebody? say, somebody. <laughs> uh, right before, mm-hmm. and I know that we're. Like you can't tell if you're watching this, but if you look, if you were to look out that window, today is like the perfect Steubenville day. It's like overcast and it's really like the, there is a, a beauty to the, like the rust belt, whatever you call that. You know what I mean? There's like this rustic beauty of the decrepitude <laughs> outside. <Dude. laughs> I'm not knocking Steubenville. No, this is like last night when you were talking to Dave, you're like, yeah, I love, I love your town. You know, it's just like shitty and like, and I'm like. And he's like, well, and then you're like, no, no, I don't mean any offense. No, I mean, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's an authenticity to it because I, I live or I live outside of, but I'm, I work within that North Metro Atlanta area that's all up and coming. And every day it seems like there's a big new shopping center or mm-hmm. a big new exciting uh, outdoor mall or something. And everything is like shiny and new and fancy and it's boring. Well, I love what you said to me last night. kind of summed it up. You said this is less real than agra- agrarian living, but it's way more real than like North Atlanta suburbs living. I was just having that conversation oh, with yeah. Neil That's while it, yeah. you were going to get your spectacles. spectacles. Yeah, your spectacles yeah, out yeah. of the car. Yeah. yeah. Then on, in the hierarchy, I think. Can of, you hear him that far away from the microphone? <laughs> I, also, right before the show, for anybody who's listening, I said, Matt is, is has been more difficult of a microphone placement guy than anybody I've ever worked with. You said that to ever. him before I came up. No, I said uh, that just to you. Yeah, no. you did, yeah. Um, uh, but speaking of microphone placements, you have a radio show, you said? I do have a radio show. You like show. that setup? Yeah, that was a great setup. Oh, uh, what's no, it called? I want to look it up. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's big. Big. AM 1160 <laughs> Quest, Atlanta's Catholic Radio. Uh, AM Catholic Radio, dozens of listeners nationwide. No, but if I stuff. YouTube it, what do I type? Um, Honest to God. The name of the show is Honest to God. Uh-huh. And then, because it's an AM radio show, you have to add maybe Quest after it. Okay, and that's your that's show. That's the name of the station. Honest to God. Yeah, and it's it's real small potatoes. Hey, this is so right cool! There? Please don't pull up and, and play it on there. There you go. You did know who did the the visuals uh-huh. and the music and everything? Who? Ben. Yeah, you can play. Oh, look at him! Put it up on screen, Neil. I can't see. <laughs> we'll see. Put it up it's on pleasant. screen. All right. No, no. There's nothing. Oh, then don't put it up on screen. No need. Oh, yeah, maybe it's because of this. There you go. Now try. Boom. But it's Ben Barron. Is it working now? No. <laughs> you know Ben Barron, don't you? Okay. Can they see, everyone see it? Yeah. All right, let's play John Henry right now. I, I hate this so much. All right. Yeah, I, I did not know this was going to happen. Hashtag more hot priests. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was... First thing John Henry There's said is hashtag more hot priests. All right. But that first that, thing, I just scrubbed it. For that one, for that one <laughs> I'm clip. sure there is. All right, let's go. Let's, I want to find yeah, you. Go somewhere else. I'm going to find you in a different place. Videos, what are you looking for in a guy? I'm going to. All right, so I just fast forward now. Let's see what he says okay. here. Probably more literal than what you're talking about, but I have a story from a friend of mine's friend, and I will not tell either of their names because that's horribly embarrassing. When my friend's friend was dating his wife, they were walking in the woods, and one of their friends had snuck through the woods to jump out in front and scare them, and they did, and my- Why have you tell stories when we can play this guy? And well, friend a good story. shoved his then girlfriend to the ground and ran in the opposite <laughs> direction. That's a true story. Oh. Yeah. I, I think, Did they get married? Oh my gracious. Yeah, they're married. They got, they got kids and stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's exceptions. So, yeah. No, no. No, I think the lesson, ladies, is get one of your friends to do that. And then if he shoves you to the ground and run away, then you just run with him and then pass him and then to the cult. We can do this. No, that's really cool. You look good. It sounds good. It's Ben Barron. Good for you. It's Ben Barron. He does all the the production stuff on this, but it's with The Quest Atlanta. Looks great. Uh, Big shout out to Janice Givens and all the wonderful people Um, who are down there. So, if you type in Honest to God Quest, Neil, could you put his. YouTube channel in the description. Actually, it looks amazing. Good yeah, for you. Fine. It's a good show. You played it down, I think, to me, or maybe you didn't mean to. But well, no, I just so it looks really great. But I, but what I'm always trying to, whenever I bring it up, whenever I'm talking about it with anybody, I'm trying to say I'm, we're not trying to do some super produced whatever. This is you know this is I don't get paid a dime to do it. Yeah, it's a ministry in a lot of ways, and the show is it's just a young adult show, like college through thirty somethings, nice. right? 
And we just have randos on, like awesome people from, we'll call up the North Georgia Catholic Center and say, hey, send us some people. And we, we <laughs> Anyone get, in particular? Nah, don't matter. <laughs> no, just, but, just but we've had turn incredible in a circle and point. people <laughs> and great conversations. And it was the Brilliant. brainchild of, not me, it's not the John Henry Spanish show at all. I'm just the moderator. Mm-hmm. And I can't help myself because I'm an only child and I like to hear myself talk <laughs> and whatever. So I will go off on some, you know, some tangents. But it's mostly just all of these different people with these different backgrounds talking about being... Catholic and young and the things that they're dealing with. Cool. And I feel like kids in high school, we minister to really well. And then college, we minister to really well. Yeah. And then it's like, all right, well, it is spring of your senior year. If you don't have your ring on your finger, you don't get any community. See you later. And then we sort of throw them out. And that's not on purpose, but mm-hmm. it's like those people, they, you know, you, you become a young adult, you get a job, you go out into the world. And then all of a sudden you don't have anybody there. There's not things that are really built towards you. You have people aren't going looking for you anymore. Is that something you experienced after you left college, or is it something you're ex, you you see your you, you, perhaps the people you teach as they grow older? You're seeing that in their lives. Well, I mean, I you know I, I had a ring on my finger. I graduated in December, and I was married in April. Uh, mm-hmm. I was engaged through that. But my community is still my root community are still those college my college friends. Yeah. So here we are, a decade and a half later, and those are still the people I hang out with, and I work in this little awesome Catholic school. And if you don't do that, you know, my, my life is not normal. Most people don't graduate from a Catholic college with Catholic friends, marry a Catholic, you know, wonderful woman, and then move into a Catholic community right away. Yeah. Right. They go out into the real world. And I say real world, not to mean like that's a fake world that I live in, but they're sort of, you're sort of on your own. Yeah. And if you're working a nine to five, you know, as a low level accountant or something and you're not married and anything, but it's fun. And the show's practical. Like we just did a show on dating apps, like which ones are Ooh. actually good. Uh, any good. So this was the consensus. <laughs> okay. and It'll be out in a little while. And I, I don't know that much about it. So I'm going to butcher some names, but there's like the, the, the Tinder, which is just the hookup app, right? Tinder, yeah. They're sort of in the categories this is what they were telling me. I've never had a dating app. Me too. Except for a fake Catholic match profile I made to make fun of one of my friends in college, which was not oh, okay. I, kinda, I want to hear that story. No, we shouldn't. Well, we're not going to tell the story. It's okay. not a good story. Uh, <laughs> but um, but there's the there's the Tinder, like just hookup apps. Yeah. And then there's the, the big one they kept talking about was Hinge. Once again, I don't know anything about it. But they said the app sort of, there's a, there's a hierarchy of how much more information you can give about yourself and the ones that are geared towards images as opposed mm. to information are the ones worth staying away from. They're more trashy. But yeah. it was really interesting. They, they went through how Be a free prostitute. That works. That's a, that's a Anthony Esselon. It's not really a thing, but that is what you're doing. You're, no. That's I, what fornication is. One of is. my favorite quotes from Anthony Esselon. Do you know what I'm going to say? Okay. From, I need to clarify. It's not what fornication is. People can have different degrees in relationships. It's not like there's beautiful holy marriage and den of iniquity. It's right. not like those are the only two options. Right. But what a lot of these apps amount to is just like, I want to have a hooker, but I don't have to pay for one. Anthony Eslin says that, he's not talking about the apps in particular, but he's talking about modern hookup culture, that the people who engage in it are literally, they're, they're saying that, they're, that they are worth less than prostitutes because he's saying at least when a prostitute says, I'll have sex with you, she she's paid, saying, yeah. my body's worth a hundred bucks an hour. As opposed to you that's saying, well, it's worth a wink and making me feel good. Maybe yeah. pick up line. No, it's good. It's yeah, true. It's awful. But anyway, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. T- like, like who are you talking to about these apps? Are these girls you're talking to about their uh, experience of the app? So the, so the app when we had guys and girls on. <clears throat> and But it was it was people who were single. Are these teenagers? Or? Uh, that one was mostly not teenagers. It was mostly young adults, 20-somethings. That's makes me so sad that there are teenagers using apps. Well, but, to where, but this is a serious question because I thought about this, right? If... Uh, Cameron runs off with a cabana boy tomorrow and you're, what? You're, cabana boy, cabana boy uh-huh. right? Or yeah. whatever. Your marriage dissolves tomorrow for yeah. whatever reason. It's annulled and all of a sudden you're on the market. I have, I mean, I'm not married to Cameron, but if that happened to me. I have no idea. I, I honestly don't know how people date. I don't know how, I, how, do you, how you meet girls. You could have used anything. a different analogy. You could have said if your wife died, she didn't have to go off with a cabana boy. Well, I, Shit. Do you have a cabana boy? I'm never going to get don't one get now. A, don't get one. <laughs> do not get I, a I gotta be honest. I don't really know what a cabana boy is. I'm I have sure an either. image of a pool and yeah. him next to it. He's but, wearing a speedo yeah. and he's in great shape. He's really, really good tan shape. and he's like <laughs> fishing something out of the pool. Yeah, and he's got a, a really great like Antonio Banderas in the early '90s accent. So, what would you do if Ange died tonight? Would you want to get remarried? Realist? No, I mean, so right now, realistically. I would want to move into the woods. And if I didn't have kids, I would just want to die. I would want to sit around and wait to die. Hmm. And I, I hope over time that would go away. Um, but if she died tomorrow and I have these children to take care of, I guess I would have to soldier on. Yeah. True story. George Washington's father, right? 
Have I told you this? No. His mom died on like a Tuesday or something, George Washington's mother. Okay. And like a week later, his father goes into town and gets married and brings her back. <laughs> the joke I always have with Angie is that if she were to die, I'm going to go find some, some woman, <laughs> mid-60s, uh-huh. overweight, incredible cook. <laughs> And she's not going to speak English. She's going to speak like Russian okay. or something. Mm-hmm. And I'm never going to learn Russian. She's never going to learn English. And there's not going to be any physical intimacy there. It's going to be a totally dissolvable <laughs> marriage. We will never consummate. And we're just going to live in this constant state of like understanding. Like every morning I'll wake up and she'll just say like breakfast <laughs> and give me breakfast. What does she get out hands. of this relationship? No, I'm going to take care of her. She's going to have a great <laughs> house. I'm going to take her out. I'm going to be great to this woman. But yeah. we're just going to have this very... Uh, platonic. Yeah, platonic. Well. Not even platonic. You won't be friends. It's more no, just... No, no. I'm going to love her. You will both love and serve each other. we will never like each other. Like each other. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be no talking. Does she have any children that she brings? She has one that never gets older. He's eight. <laughs> what's his name? Uh, what's his name? Um, Igor. Okay. Igor! Igor! She just, there's a lot of snapping. Yeah. And then Igor's very... He's very like... Subservient. Like timid. Timid, And yeah. nice. And we have a couple of moments where I just sort of put my hand on his shoulder and I'm like, it's going to be okay. Yeah. I don't know what that is in context too, but... Yeah. And my kids are going to grow up and age out and, and I'm going to live with this perpetually 68-year-old woman <laughs> and our perpetually 8-year-old son, Igor. Yeah. I don't think I would get married again. I really, I really don't. Do you think like real, real talk, I don't think I would ever try to get married again. Do you think realistically you would feel different in five years? Just being lonely? Yeah, possibly. <clears throat> I don't... It felt like when we were younger, I don't know if it was I was less aware of how messy I was. Right. And then you get married and all of your mess comes to the surface. You're like, wow, I'm a difficult you person. Mean, you mean to like be metaphorical around. mess? Yeah. Not like you. Well, maybe both, tissues. but that's part of the yeah. mess, you know? Right. Um, I don't know. Like when you get married young, it's. You know, it's difficult to live well, with. Like my wife and I have been married 16 years. I love her to death. She's beautiful. I'd kill anyone that hurts her. Love her. Right. And I'd, I'd invite you to help me kill them. 100%. But I can keep my mouth shut. I know. I got a lot of land. That's why I'd invite you. But <laughs> well, what, one thing that seems so, and it's going to sound cliche when I say it, but that you hear when you're younger mm-hmm. is you'll hear people talk about how like you, they, they love their wives so much more. And when I, when I was a kid, they, or I'm sorry, as they get older, they, you love your, life, your wife so much more. And I, and I was a kid and a younger man. I remember sitting with Angie in like an IHOP or something, and you would look at old people. And what do old people do? They just sort of sit there silently, yeah. like just eating oatmeal, not even really looking at each other. And I used to always interpret that as, oh, you're old, and you've, you're out of things to say to each other. I thought that too. And now I, I'm starting to see it more and more as you're just comfortable and yes. in love and like you okay mean, sitting yes. there in that silence and being in the no, presence I, of No, I did the person. exact same thing when my wife and I were dating at a pub. I remember looking <clears> at this couple who weren't talking and just thinking, how sad. Like, right. We have everything to talk we'll about. We'll never be like that. Mm-hmm. But I can't wait to be like that. I had this thought this morning that I shared with Cameron, and I'm just playing with it. I don't know if it's true or not. But I said to her, and I don't think this is true, but I want to see if there's any truth in it. I said, I don't think women are beautiful until they're at least 30. Before 30, that's they're a pretty. really interesting. Oh, yeah. okay. They're All right, pretty, I see the distinction. But okay. they're not yet beautiful. But I don't know if that's true, because obviously I would have said, maybe it's because I'm old, and now 20-year-olds look like 10-year-olds to me. I don't, no, I don't, I don't think that's true. I disagree with that. I think... I was having a conversation in a Theology of the Body class a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about modesty or something. And we were talking about when you're walking down the street at, at the beach or whatever, and a girl walks by and she's wearing a string bikini, or <clears> you see a billboard that's basically pornographic, trying to sell you like a cheeseburger or something. Mm-hmm. I saw a sexy cheeseburger billboard the other day. It's mm-hmm. a true story. Um, or pornography itself, right? Yeah. And when you're, when you're a man, I think if we're honest with ourselves, right? Especially when we're younger men, when you see pornography or a girl who's scantily clad or dressed really immodestly, you look at that and there is like a lizard brain response uh, that, that is eye-catching, yes. right? That is, that is thrilling. That is yes. exciting, mm-hmm. right? My heart beats faster and chemicals in my brain start to do the things that they're supposed to do. But you never find that beautiful, right? You never find that attractive, right? You find it- Or you're uh, attracted in a base sense, but not in a deep way. A hedonistic kind of way, Yeah. right? And I was saying that out loud to these boys and these boys and I were having sort of this back and forth and there are all these young women in the room. And the idea was like, when you see that woman, you're not saying, oh my goodness, you're someone I want to get to know. Like, let me, mm. I, you, you are beautiful. And I want to give my, I want to I die want to you, myself I want for you to your be the sake, of my have children. my children. Yeah. Let me love yeah. and honor you all the days of my life. That never crosses your mind. Whereas beauty is in this different category. It's that mysterious. Has, well, the, the hedonism and the baseness stripped away. Yeah. 
And it's the, I want you. That's why nuns are so beautiful. Yeah, I think you're right. Jason Everett has this line where he says, the problem with dressing immodestly is if the first thing that attracts a man's attention is your body, he's tempted to get to know the body, not the person. Whereas what you want to present is your person, which includes your body, but it's, it's veiled and it's mysterious and alluring in the right way. Well, one of the most beautiful women that I've had any contact with in the past year was a old wheelchair bound nun in the airport when we yeah. were coming back from Africa. Do you remember that? You, I didn't meet her, but you okay. came and told me that I kneeled down beside her and we held hands and she couldn't even speak English really well, but I just, she sort of motioned to me and I, you know, I always make an effort of being like, just thank you for your vocation. God yeah. bless you or whatever. And she just sort of reached out to me and she sort of patted my hand and she said some things to me. I have no idea what they yeah. were, but, uh, it was good. It was great. And there yeah. is that attraction that you feel towards them that doesn't have any of that Filth mixed in. It's sort of like, not to go down, um, not to get too much into sexuality, but it's sort of like sex or sexual activity outside of marriage, right before you were married, Mm -hmm. because I sort of had this checkered, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever, before I met my bride. And then within, whereas beforehand, not to be crass, but it feels like scratching an itch in a way. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, good. Okay, that thing that my body says I need to do, I've done, and that felt good, and that's over. But then there's sort of that, the barnacles and the filth and everything that's tied up in it. And yeah. then after you're married, when it's like, oh, that was, a, that was great. That was amazing. I'm not trying to. No, I got a great quote here that I want to look up from uh, C.S. Lewis. I've been on a C.S. Lewis kick lately. Have actually. You? Yeah. He has this great, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I'll be able to find it, but it's, What's he, it about? He, he says that, um, He talks about the difference between lust and love, just like you're talking about scratching an itch. And Mm -hmm. he says whether or not there's any real love there can be seen whether you still want this woman after your itch has been scratched. And he says, like, a man doesn't keep the carton of cigarettes after he's smoked them. Right. Um, Yeah, I shared that one with my my Theology of the Body kids. He's got mm. so many awesome quotes for Theology of the Body. Like, with, with that class, with any of sort of philosophy classes or theology classes, I always try to tell the kids, I'm not actually, I don't actually... I'm not good at any of this stuff. I just know people who are good at this stuff. So we're going to read and talk about things that people who are way better than I am at articulating things have to say. But wouldn't you say, like, uh, you've gotten way better at these things by God's grace? By God's like grace you're a, you're and a good by husband. You're borrowing a... heavily from people who are wonderful. Oh, you mean the, th- the things you're saying? Yeah. Oh, I see. I thought you were saying, like, I'm not good at, like, loving my wife. I'm not good at chastity. I'm not. No, I, th- I think I absolutely need to grow in all of those things. Yeah. But my whole life, I feel like, has basically just been identifying people who are the kind of people I want to be like yeah. and just lashing myself to their masts. Amen. I said that to my boss the other I day. I love that. I said, like, I just want you to know that I, I pretty much tied myself to your mast and I'm going wherever the ship goes. So if I it goes see. down, I'm going down with it because yes. you are the kind of person I want to be. Your children are the kind of children I want mine to become. You, right. you got this way better than I do. I love that. Here's a quote from Lewis. He says, lust is a poor, weak, whimpering, whispering thing compared with the richness and energy of desire, which will arise when lust has been killed. That's beautiful. So good. He's the man. He is the man. Uh, I want to quote C.S. Lewis again. He would apparently smoke 60 cigarettes a day. <laughs> Great. It's awful. We, do, we don't endorse that here on Pints with Aquinas. And then, uh, no, but the Cigar Lounge is opening tonight <laughs> at 7 p.m. We're doing the ribbon cutting. We actually had a dude who plays Chesterton on the BBC, or has, not always does, but, and um, EWTN, and he's coming to cut our ribbon with a sabre, like, like a walking stick so sabre. Cool. Isn't that great? That's Apparently awesome. when Chesterton got married, he bought a gun and a sword, and he would always walk around with both a gun. You just carried them all the time? <laughs> Apparently. I was at the Georgia <laughs> Trappers Convention auction, okay. right? In Georgia, like, steel foot traps, right? They trap coyotes and all of these things. And you have to be licensed and everything. But I've been getting into that with my kids. And we were at the convention. And it's like, they had this auction, but I've been to a lot of galas and stuff where this is a fancy auction, and they're auctioning off the trip. This one is just, like, auctioning off stuff <clears throat> from people's sheds. And I bought in the auction... <laughs> A, I love it. For my son, yeah. a pirate saber, like a real one, not a toy. It's yeah. metal. and I mean, it's decorative. You know, you'd lose if you fought an actual pirate. Yeah. A samurai katana <laughs> and a giant broadsword, like a Mel Gibson Braveheart. I mean, you say trash from people's sheds, but that sounds pretty fancy. Yeah, but they're old. Oh, they're they're really old, old and rusty and they're yeah, cheaply yeah. made and the coolest stuff in the world. Yeah, That's it's awesome. Good. So we've been having a lot, of, a lot of sword fights in my backyard. Should we talk about Africa? I would love to talk about Africa. We could process Africa because you and I haven't really hung out since we went. 
don't think we had a, con- a conversation other than text a messages. Of text messages and a me sending you <coughs> photos of my face going. For some reason. That's weird. That's different. That's what I do. It's no, my I like thing. It. I appreciate it. Me and my friend just said, <laughs> um, yeah, so we went to, well, so it was about a couple of years ago, you said that you wanted to go hunt in Africa. So here's what it was. You tell me. You were going, you had done that mission work in Uganda, yeah. Zimbabwe, over there. Uganda. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you were doing your next year, you were going to mm-hmm. go to Zimbabwe. That's right. And a couple of places like Kenya, yeah. Zimbabwe, Nigeria, somewhere mm-hmm. else. Right. And you invited me to go. And I said, yeah, I would love to go while we're there since I was eight i've been dreaming about going hunting in africa right i read uh green hills of africa was mm. ernest hemingway it's not a narrative or it is a narrative but it's not it's a uh, non-fiction mm. right it's just a real account of his trip that he took to africa oh that's goodness. sort of stylized but it's read that. incredible you've got to read it and it just lit this fire that's like old school africa before mm-hmm. everything right like you know out of africa africa from that's another great book and yeah, I wanted to go, and we actually had one set up. Like, you didn't know this because I hadn't, I was getting it all done on the back end. Yeah. You said, you set it up and then let me know, and I'll sort of come in. Yeah. And we had a trip set up in Zimbabwe, which I'm really glad it ended up following through, actually, because from what I understand about the just the whole situation in Zimbabwe versus where we went in Namibia, I feel much better about hunting in Namibia. We can mm-hmm. talk more about that later if you want to. But, uh, and it was going to be a short trip. It's going to be a couple of days just after a mission trip before we flew home. And then COVID happened. I got it all squared away in February of 2020, I think. Hmm. And then COVID happened and we didn't get to go. And I was super bummed. And I don't even remember how I was able to pay for it then for the Zimbabwe one. But I, it, for whatever reason, now I had in my head, I've got to hunt in Africa. We're going to hunt in Africa. And so then it ended up coming together. A big shout out to the stimulus that was supposed to stimulate the American economy that I <laughs> spent all on uh, in Namibia. <laughs> yeah, Namibian safari. Yeah, but it was killer. I I I, I want to hear your opinions on it because I yeah. I do that thing. You know, I go to yeah. I go on outfitted hunts and I go all over yeah, the like place. Yeah, the, the hunt. only hunting I did prior to this is when you hang one of those sticky tapes up in your kitchen to catch flies. No, I I watch. I helped you step on a mouse in a closet. That's one time true. In we Georgia, did, we did do that. Yeah, but yeah, no, I'd never been hunting, and you said you wanted to do it, and uh, we had a couple of years to kind of put some money away and it wasn't as expensive as I thought actually I was really surprised but well and I I think I confess this to you but I had told everyone I knew how worried I was about you being in Africa mm-hmm. because my fear was we were going to do one day yeah. one day out there and it was going to be hard it was going to be sweaty and yeah. everything and at the end you were going to give me like a do you mind if tomorrow I just I was going to read like Brothers Karamozov and drink some tea instead like yeah fun I'll be here I'll just hold down the fort that's a fair fair yeah. fear yeah. I think my wife was afraid. I was kind of afraid of that as well. I wasn't really afraid of it. I just thought, I don't know if I'll really enjoy this. Um, it's funny. This will make sense in a minute. But like a, a couple of months before that, I went golfing for the first time. Okay. Like I've been to driving ranges and putt putt. I've, I've been putting on actual golf greens and things like that. But I've never played a whole round mm-hmm. of golf. And I went with a few fellas from here and hated it so much. Yeah. And so I was kind of afraid it was going to be like that. That's why I think day two, as we were like, uh, you know, hiking through the savannah, I looked at you and said, this is so much better than golf. And <laughs> I, like, I remember that. You don't remember? No, I do remember oh, that, yeah. but I also remember never following up. And I thought that was a strange. <laughs> like, it's such a strange. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I yeah. just loved it but so much, man. I just amazing. had such a great time. Before we get to Africa, let's talk about our flight over. That was amazing. So okay. we, we were right by the I, toilet. I, I, I want to talk about okay. Delta Sky Lounges. Oh, my gosh. Or dude. Virgin Atlantic yes. Sky Lounges. We're going to tell right. the Yeah. So, but the, before we get to there, oh, okay. all, right. all right, so you were like, I'm just going to have four bourbons and go to sleep on this airplane. And I'm like, I'm not going to be able to sleep on this airplane. So you were right up the back of uh, Virgin Airlines. Mm-hmm. And we fly, I don't know how long it takes, eight hours or something to get to London? It's forever, yeah. Eight hours, uh, it was eight hours to London and then 12, 12 hours, hours to Johannesburg. To, yeah. yeah. So we got there and both of us were so exhausted. And London Heathrow Airport was just packed to the gills. Right. It was completely uh, uncomfortable. There, there was no free seats to just sit well, we on. We found some seats, got ready to go to bed, and, s- and then were immediately kicked out by the nicest airport yeah. whatever lady. So sorry. <laughs> You guys can't be here. This is actually a closed area. Did you see the signs? Yeah. So you laid down on the hard floor and promptly fell asleep. I slept for like three hours. It's yeah. so amazing. I don't know how you I'm do a pro. it. I can, I can fall asleep right now on air right here. <laughs> well, <laughs> just stream. I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but let's not do it. But um, anyway, then I, I was looking around while you were sleeping. I was so exhausted. And then I found Virgin Atlantic Lounge. 
And then I came and I woke you up because <laughs> it was worth waking you, you up for. You kicked me. I remember you I kicking kicked me on you. the ground. Yeah. Because I, I went in there and I'm like, are you kidding me? It's uh, If you've ever been to like a Delta lounge or something, this is significantly it's better. so much better. So I came and I got you and I'm like, trust me. And what was it like? All right. I know, I've, I know you've heard me say this before, so I'll, yeah. I'll tell it to Neil. Neil, did you ever watch The Twilight Zone? Uh, yeah. Like, a did you? Right. Good. Do you remember show. the episode where the guy, he's a criminal, he's like a mobster, mm. he dies, and he thinks he goes to heaven, but he's really in hell. But he thinks he's in heaven because he, you remember this episode? He wakes up in a hotel room, and all the <laughs> casino, he can't lose any of the games, he can't lose poker, he can't lose blackjack, he wins every time he, he pulls the slots. All the women love him. All the drinks are free. All the food. You can just walk up and order anything. And the episode, about the first three quarters of the episode, is him just having this great time. And then said, I can't believe I actually made it to heaven. It's so easy to get up here. And then he starts to realize as time goes on, it's really boring. I'm winning everything. Everything's so great. The first three quarters of the episode is what the Virgin Atlantic Skyline is. <laughs> <laughs> it is 6 a.m. And I'm on my second bourbon. And it's free. And we're while sitting I eat my in, eggs these, Benedict. in this dark they had these like lounges right. that were like rainforest looking like, the thing. vines around us. <laughs> and, and they were enclosed, so we would both lay on these really lovely little couch chairs. And then you would use your phone to order stuff and they would bring it to you. <laughs> and it was all free. Yeah, he kept <laughs> clicking at people. Uh, I, I never, never, I never did clicked that, no it. once. But. Uh, I took a steam I took a shower, then, then I took a, a shower. steam shower. A st yes, steam shower. Yes. It was amazing. It, yeah, it was. was really cool. Yeah, we <laughs> we ordered so much food, like bacon and eggs and yeah, eggs Benedict and like five mimosas. And, and everybody's so nice. I mean, I'm sure they, they have to be, so but it was nice. It was amazing. Delta Lounge was fine, but it was like Something you know they had like the buffet this. there and and whatever. But Virgin Atlantic, that was where it was at. That was amazing. So I really appreciate you flying all over the place and having lots of miles. So yeah, we could do that. So then we went to Johannesburg. Johannesburg, it's awful. I didn't like whatever. it. Whatever, South Africa. Lots of whatever. lots of zebra parts for yeah. sale in the gift shop. Ah, watched a bit of cricket in the smoke room. Did we watch cricket? I did. Oh, you explained cricket to me there. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Which was good because the other day I was house sitting and there were a bunch of there were a bunch of boys playing cricket behind the house and in, Indian in coming. Yeah, little Indian boys. They just, love cricket. Like, I understood so, it a little bit. So cricket's the second most watched sport after soccer. Really? And it's because go of further down. Our wonderful. What's third? Do you know I third? have no idea. Yeah. Baseball but darts. I don't know. It's because of our yeah. wonderful Indian friends. But yeah, yeah, whenever I find people in America playing cricket, it's the Indians. But it, I just love it. It's uh, Yeah, I don't get it. Uh, yeah. But it's probably because I didn't grow up with it. Totally. Yeah. So we flew to Namibia. That was fun. The little air link flight. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. And then we got off and the Namibian airport is about the size of an average like racetrack gas station. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get in a car and we drive. And as soon as you leave Windhoek, right, which yeah. is the capital of Namibia, like as soon as you cross out of it, remember the roads just stop being there. Stop being roads. <laughs> I drove, you didn't go with me this time, but one, one of the days I drove two and a half hours yeah. somewhere else and we never touched asphalt. We were driving 60 miles an hour down <laughs> dirt roads. <laughs> uh, and I think we saw outside of the airport altogether maybe 30 other human beings. Yeah, so Namibia time. is a very unpopulated country. I think it's the second most Le sparsely populated country in the world, yeah. I think. So am I right? How many hundreds of thousands of acres were we on at this hunting? So we had, so it, our, the, 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 the concession that our guys had was like 50,000 acres, but then they had permission and all these other areas beside it. So, you know, when you would like, they would walk you through a cattle gate or something and you were mm -hmm. on somebody else's area. Uh, then the one next to us was 50,000 acres, and there's another one that was 75 and 120. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Infinity. Infinity yeah. land. I, 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 when my wife texted me and said, take some photos of the animals, I realized that she didn't understand what this thing was. Right. It wasn't like we were at a zoo. Well, people think a lot of times with African that you're just hunting in big cages yeah. for animals. No. That was not it. No. That was not we it would, we, So anyway, great lodge. We would wake up at six every morning. Mm -hmm. Stand out, have our coffee, and watch that sunrise. I've never seen a sunrise that beautiful. If you so, I, I spent a lot of time out in Wyoming. Big shout out to Wyoming Catholic College in Lander. Yeah, but it reminds me of Wyoming, except it's bigger somehow. And maybe that's just a feeling mm. thing. But you would because you can see the sun all day. There's like mm. three trees out there, right? <laughs> well, they're all it's low canopy, right? Yeah, and you watch it rise and you see it go. And we were out there in winter too, so it was cold in the mornings. It was freezing cold. But no, that sunrise was so beautiful. Yeah, it was amazing. just and I, I was sad when I would try to take photos of it for my wife because he just couldn't capture it. There were so many. Like I remember Mario, 
yeah. who was our our guy, like our tracker. Yeah, That's tracker right. Skinner. He was he was awesome. He said that. Were, were you with me when he said that, or was I with the boy who was? Remind with us? me. Um, he said, "Don't don't take a picture. It will never be the same." Yeah, yeah, he did back. say that, and he was exactly right. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, so we would have our coffee, and then we'd get in the back of a Land, Land Rover, yeah. Land Cruiser, and uh, so we're sitting in the back on these chairs with our gun. And binoculars. <laughs> Although what was funny is when I pulled out my binoculars. You said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got, I've got I've my got binoculars. binoculars. I had a pair like this big, like the kind of like, because they told us what to bring. So I had like Boy Scout binoculars and John Henry's doing this. <laughs> like, Can I please borrow yours? But even with my big boy serious binoculars, I remember it was kind of embarrassing because we would be up there scour as if we could do anything, as if we had any idea what was going on. <laughs> and then Mario, who was the five foot three little Namibian guy behind us, would go... Yes. And point yes. and be like two miles away, herd of wildebeest. Yes. And then you would get off and you would go bushwhacking for two he, miles. Yes. He was amazing. Yeah, he was. I don't think I was aware of just how much exercise it would be. Right. Because it's not like, oh, there's one, kill it. It was like, I think there's something up there. And then we would hike for a few hours. Right. And I'm not exaggerating when I say many of the bushes had uh thorns the size of toothpicks right like if you snap one off you would mistake it well, for a toothpick and bush is an understating word right because there were trees i mean mm -hmm. they were big big tall tree i mean they were taller than our, our truck and they would just say heads up and you would look up That's and right. you would just see swinging towards you a branch <laughs> yeah i got a few covered in finger sized <laughs> yeah but they say like one of the you told me this right that there's three main areas in africa you've got the jungle the desert and the savanna right and what makes the savanna so great to hunt on is because of the low canopy you can <clears throat> see for miles um the trees aren't so tall that the animals can hide in them okay? right but you also have to you can creep through the uh, well, savanna yeah, without it's a lot being harder seen. for them to hide i mean you we would not see animals for long stretches of time mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you'd be like oh my goodness there's a herd of 30 of whatever's mm -hmm. right over there uh, and then they would take, it's amazing how quickly they disappeared. I mean, I think oh about that all gosh. the time in the whitetail woods, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if I ever told you this, but Sorrel, so our professional hunter, the yeah. guy who is, there's a guy who just not, you know, this, but for Neil, for anybody listening, right? There's a guy whose job it is. He works, he's licensed by the Namibian government to be a professional hunter and he's required to be with you. So he says, you know, you can shoot this one. You can't shoot right. that one, which is why we had situations Yes. Like when you were perched up on that rock over those rocks, looking mm -hmm. at a herd of wildebeest for two hours. Yeah, and, and then at the end, there there's were no bull. cows. There were bulls, but there weren't big bulls. Oh, I see. Yeah. So he said, "No bulls, no good bulls." And then we had to back so out. So frustrating because you would see these animals. Every one of them looks like the most beautiful, majestic thing you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. But then they look at him through binoculars and they say, "No, he's not old enough." Mm. He also told me that you were the loudest walker me? he's ever heard. <laughs> yeah. He said, Matt is so loud. He does not understand how to walk. Sorrel said to, this? Yeah. Sorrel. That's funny. I thought I was doing pretty good. No, he I said really you were, did. He said you were the worst. A, the, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> the worst. Top 10? No, no, no. The worst. Yeah. yeah. The food was incredible. It was all stuff that we shot. I mean, it was all the food. It was all things yeah. that we had killed out there. So Now, one thing they helped me understand was trophy hunting and why it's a great idea because i gotta be honest as someone who's not right. a hunter when i would see people post with pictures that they'd killed i just thought just seems not not mean because i understand we kill animals and eat them but just especially the more kind of uh rare animals it right. just seemed right. awful so tell us why it's not immoral to well, do so this. so first off i really hope Louis, the guy who runs that whole operation, takes you up on the yeah. offer because he's going to be here for Safari Club International Convention. Be cool in to Nashville have him on because so I, I said to him, "What do you say to people who say like you shouldn't be trophy hunting?" Right. These people have no understanding of Africa, so and hunting. What I thought was, and I'll, I'll start with this, and then it'll sort of zoom down to some of the other stuff. We'll talk about rhinos, right? Rhinoceros, yes. endangered rhinos, right? Right. Um, and you hear all these save the rhino things and, and all of this, and Louis was saying over and over again. They should let us farm rhinos. We farm, have to farm them. Right. And well, the, the horn is what he talked right. about too. Right. So if, first of all, Neil, how does this sound to you? Like we should be able to trade rhino horn. Doesn't that sound like an awful thing to say? Just on the face of it. Here's why it's not. Right. So, okay. So he drew a, he drew a, um, a correlation between Botswana, right, right nearby, and Namibia. And he said in Botswana, for years they had outlawed hunting. 
There was no hunting mm-hmm. in Botswana. And he said what happened in Botswana is the game population was totally depleted. Right. All these animals were dead or were, were, were gone. They were moving further down from vulnerable to threatened to endangered in these areas over there. And there was just this decimation of just all the fauna in that area. And he said it's because those animals don't have a price associated with it. And we can talk all day about fuzzy feely stuff, about how it makes us sad when we see a rhino or a giraffe or an elephant or any of the charismatic megafauna, right, Mm -hmm. that we grew up watching cartoons of. Mm -hmm. When we see those die, sure, but the reality is that we're sitting here in an air-conditioned office, right, with electrical lighting and a stomach full of food, talking about how it hurts our feelings when these animals die. Whereas the locals, the people who live there on the ground in Botswana or Namibia or Tanzania or Mozambique, whatever it is, they need to survive until tomorrow. And if the things around them aren't helping them do that, if there's no value associated with those right. animals outside of the calori- uh, calories that I can get from eating it, then they're going to kill and eat the animals. Right. Or if they're preying on the cows and the livestock right. that they do have or taking up their resources and right. they're a pest, then they kill them. So you're sitting over, you're hanging out in Zimbabwe right now and you've got a little farm and you know a few kids to feed and everything. And surrounding your farm are a whole bunch of spring buck and Jim's buck and leopards, right? And you grow some food, you raise some animals, and the only thing that those spring buck and Jim's buck and leopards represent if you're not hunting are things that are going to eat my goats, things that are going to graze on the grass where my cows are grazing, things that are going to get into my vegetable garden. So I want to get rid of them because they're a nuisance, but also they're made of meat. They taste delicious. Mm -hmm. I'm going to shoot those things, and I'm going to take what I can from them because they're worth nothing other than they look nice in a picture when some tourist drives by Mm -hmm. or something. Whereas trophy hunting, and I do want to call it trophy hunting. I want to double down on the term trophy hunting mm-hmm. because there, uh, while we, while people ate every scrap, including the organs of the animals that we killed, we did not. The only thing that legally we can do mm-hmm. is take home hides and horns, right? Mm-hmm. We can take home the heads, we can take down the horns and put them on our walls. So we are hunting for a trophy, even though everything's being used by the locals. But when you have trophy hunting in an area, all of a sudden that guy who's looking at the Jim's Buck, Spring Buck, and Leopards as dangerous and also edible, right? Now he's saying, oh, those are each worth a dollar amount. Because how it works in Namibia and a lot of these other countries is you and I show up, we shoot some animals, we get to take pictures, we get to take animals home. The locals get every scrap of the meat and they also get money. They're paid Mm-hmm. for the sake of these animals, because those animals are worth a dollar amount. And because they're worth a dollar amount, they're protected and they increase in population. Right. And what I was going to say about rhino horns earlier is, I didn't realize this, rhino horns grow back. Right. So if you allow people to trade rhino horns, it's like you've got a golden goose. You take right. really good care of that goose. Yeah, he said $250,000 a horn is yeah. what you can get for a rhino horn in China right now. And what you have, and we were talking about this specifically, because they have poachers. Mario... Right. Our our skinner, our tracker on the on the car said that he has had multiple times on safari with like guys like me and you riding around with him, where he said, "Put your guns on the top of the car," and they drove up fast on people who were poaching on the property yeah. to have them arrested or have them thrown out. Or, yeah, so it's like once you allow trophy hunting, you don't just have the government who's generally inefficient at most of these sorts of things. Right. You have people who are trying to make money off the land that they have, who right. are working with the government to. And, well, and it's just taking human na- nature into account too, right? Yeah. Because. Unfortunately, humans are selfish and humans are going to do things that are going to benefit them, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And if I'm a poor guy living over in Africa who doesn't know how to get food on the table, but there's rhinos out there that the only reason they're protected is because they look pretty and make like white college girls in the United States feel good when nobody's allowed to shoot them, of course I'm going to go kill that thing and I'm going to take the horn. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I'm managing a property that has these rhinos on it, they're worth something to me and they're they're, they're worth being protected. I think he said something like the population of elephants in Namibia yeah. went up 10 times yeah. since they started Crazy. to allow trophy hunting, <coughs> which sounds so counterintuitive, but right. it's for all the reasons you just mentioned. Well, and it's so well managed, which to the point of frustration, like I said, yeah. we would see these beautiful, majestic animals and I would say, come on, like I, let, let me, me kill it. <laughs> let me kill that. It's great. It looks beautiful. I would love, I want that so badly, right? I want that beautiful head above my fireplace or whatever. And they would say, no, it's too small. Four Mm -hmm. inches, four inches too small. Um, Because they have all of these that they're required by the Namibian government. They have all these standards that they have to to abide by. And they won't let you export those heads unless they they are a certain certain length. They have to be Mm -hmm. male. They have to be a certain age. 
It was really cool. Yeah, it was a great time. Um, I hope he comes on. You should get him on. Yeah, if he wants to. I mean, I, I extended the invitation. He's a really f- wonderful guy, I thought. We had a great time. Well, and we were just pampered. It really was. Well, I mean, it was because so it was you and me hunting, and then it was two other fellas right. hunting. <laughs> I remember we came back for lunch that first day at one, and we had nothing. And what are they? No, Did no, they... it was worse than nothing. I had missed a shot that day, right? I had, I had gotten, I had whiffed a shot on mm. a red heart of beast, and then they show up. <laughs> With, with a, a dragon. Truck they shot down a dragon. <laughs> with multiple animals. And every day, that was it. It became a joke. It did become a joke. Yeah, like uh, like we'd be sitting out on the deck with nothing, just like having a smoke, and we'd joke about them driving with a dragon t- attached to by a chain. <laughs> Do you guys know dragons were real? I had no idea. Like, you bloody. <laughs> they were great guys, though. It was a lot they of really fun to are. have them out there. Um, but we ended up catching up. We did all right by the yeah. end. Yeah, it was real fun. Yeah, and it was really neat to see the uh, see the contrast because there's almost like you know, where we were staying was a compound. Like uh, the house we stayed in had a big fence around it, yeah. and they were self sufficient. They mm-hmm. grew their own food. They had greenhouses and all of that. But then there was almost a little village of locals that was attached to it. Yeah, and they did all the work there. Mm-hmm. And somebody killed something large one time that brought it in. Not one of us, but one of our mm-hmm. friends. And the village, these these people just descend on it. And yeah. All these little kids are running around in Spider-Man pajamas and everything, and they're cutting off and pieces and handing them out. And there is blood flowing mm-hmm. right by their feet. It stinks to high heaven. And there's a bunch of these beautiful little kids. And you and I looked at each other and said, these kids are going to grow up way more well-rounded than kids with iPhones. And the kids who are sitting inside so staring at their better. laptops. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I was really I was really interested with the, the last day, if you remember that last morning, <clears throat> Did you go bird hunting with me the last morning? No, I went bird hunting the night, the day okay. before on my so, own. Yeah, I went bird hunting, me, Mario, and we just were, were driving around, and then we'd get out and walk and flush some quail, because bird hunting is not a thing over there. They don't do wing shooting mm-hmm. in Namibia. And the only food these guys eat, the only meat they get, the only protein they get is what's hunted. And so Mario was up there saying, Franklin, shoot the Franklin, shoot the Franklin. He was like telling me, please go shoot this because I want this, and we don't shoot these because oh. they're worth money. But you can shoot it and then give it to me and give it to these kids and whatever. And then when we get back, he's dividing up the birds in order of, you know, how good they are. And he's saying, I'm going to take this and this is for this family and these are for these children. We don't really eat doves here, so we give them to the children and they will eat them. They'll make something out of the breast meat. And Mm. it was just really neat. What was that bird they said tasted terrible? Oh, the guinea fowl. The guinea fowl. He said the joke about guinea fowl is you kill it, defeather it boil it with a rock on top of it right and then after an hour of boiling it you throw the guinea bird away and you eat, eat the, the rock, rock. Yeah. <laughs> but they were everywhere they would run in front of the car forever and, yeah. and all of that stuff um we can keep talking about that but i wanted to ask some questions because we got a bunch from our oh, do we have a bunch? L- local cool. supporters yeah do you want to tell, say about the one negative comment that came up in our last video? No, I don't. No. All right, I will say this. So, I, so I, I'm not. I'm not reading comments. Man, right? there is a ton of questions. Yeah. I did. Uh, we'll do that. I did that. I did the one last February or March or something when I came up here for for pints, and uh, I I felt the, the episode came out, and then I started reading the comments, and you know you get ninety good comments, and you get but you get a couple of bad ones. And those are the ones that you remember. And I realized how emasculine it was for me to be like reading and worrying and all. Yeah. I felt like a like an eighth grade girl uh, obsessed with her Instagram page and mm-hmm. what people were were liking and what yeah. they, what they weren't. Uh, no, I will. Okay, fine. I'll do that one only because I told a group of fourteen year olds that I teach. Yeah, do comment. it. But I mean, you're exactly right. And I, I made a decision a couple of months ago to stop reading YouTube comments entirely. Right. And you lose something from that because I know people want you to interact with them and they like right. it if you see their comment, but I don't care. I'd so people who support me on locals, I care about these people. Like these are amazing human beings. They support us financially and they can only comment because they're giving us ten bucks a month or something. Right. People don't pay ten bucks a month to then like troll you. Oh, that's but the, a great you know point. what I mean? Sure. So even if they're critical, <laughs> they, they they offer it like a friend would. Well, that's, that's what I was going to say. As opposed to I'm YouTube not talking comments. about criticism. I'm not talking about, hey, I disagree with you on this. Yeah, yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah. hey, that, that was an yeah. interesting point, but aren't like, you forgetting about like, this? It's like, why are your like, eyebrows wrong? weird? Right. Yes. Yeah, like, <laughs> but like but that. the one that I repeated <laughs> was somebody wrote, Span looks like he's one ham sandwich away from a heart attack. <laughs> and my wife <laughs> so still specific. brings that up. <laughs> <laughs> like that one hurt all right and for the record i've had a lot of ham sandwiches since then so you were wrong no heart attacks in your face do we have the um can we have a break so i can get a coffee 
Or is it not there? Or else you can just talk to him. You chat with him while I make a coffee. Or else go to break. Will you get me a coffee? Do you? Yeah. Or, I mean, if we go to break, I'll get a coffee. Do you have the break thing there? Yeah, I have the break thing. Yeah, two minutes. Or, or you just, you, it might be better if he asks, you ask him questions and you talk. Because you're much more interesting than two minute break. I'll go make coffee. I'll be back. All right, sounds good. We two coffees. Two What's coffees. I'm going to get it right here. Oh, thank you. Swiss okay. Process. All right, Neil, what we got? <laughs> Those of you who can't, because there's not a camera on Neil, Neil is wearing one of the best button-up shirts I've ever seen in my life today. I'll show the shirt off. William, good. Yeah. Come on over. It's pretty sweet. He's rocking socks and sandals and living the dream right now. So it is a shirt. corduroy shirt. This of shirt mammals. I got in Amarillo, Texas, when I was visiting my now fiance. Okay. So she's working on a movie, <clears throat> um, which is actually I think going to be in festivals soon. Called What Remains. And okay. We saw this shirt in a store that mm -hmm. I don't remember the name of, and she's like, I'm buying you this I would wear the heck so out of that shirt. I do. It gets a lot of mileage. I really, I really like that thing. I, uh, so when I went to Africa, I packed one backpack carry on mm -hmm. for a two week trip over to Africa. And when I came here for the cigar opening and to do this, uh, I came with my wife, and we packed a gigantic duffel bag carry-on that we had to wait to come out of it. And in that, and I'm not just doing the cliche like women pack a lot, <laughs> but that's true, mm -hmm. right? She does tend to do it more, but I, I'm still not sure how I managed to make this much stuff. When I literally, I, I got this shirt, which I wore yesterday. It still smells like cigars. I'm going to wear it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I brought one mass shirt. I brought one pair of jeans, mm -hmm. one pair of boots, and a pair of khaki pants, and somehow. We still managed to fill up a duffel bag mm -hmm. for this trip, so it's pretty good. <laughs> That's all I used to pack. I used to just do my uh, carry-on backpack. Yeah, I just hate, that, especially if you can do laundry. Even if you just have a sink mm -hmm. that you can wash socks and underwear in. I've never done that. But you've never done. You've never done like the underwear no, and so? not in the sink. No. When I was in college, and this is not something that that I'm proud of, I think in my entire life, not counting hunting clothes, because I do all my own hunting clothes because you have to wash them in special. Yeah, I wash mm -hmm. them in some scent-free stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I do. Uh, I think I did two loads of laundry the entire time that I was in college in an actual like washing machine. Mm. Now, to be fair, I'm an only child. I'm spoiled. My, I went home. My mom would do my laundry sometimes. Mm. My mm -hmm. now wife would do my laundry sometimes at school. But most of the time, my laundry consisted of underwear and socks mm. in the kitchen sink in my dorm room. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So that was pretty sweet. Cool. How's the coffee coming, Matt? Yeah. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Yeah. We'll give you some more shirt facts or something. What we got? Shirt facts. Well, what I was thinking of when you were talking about women pack a lot is I remember I used to always be like, why do people need such big wardrobes? Right. But then, um, I don't know, dating Shayla. And then like one time I would, you know, looked in her closet and I was like, there's so many clothes here. And I was like, I like that because it's like, you know, adorning a beautiful thing. It's good to Ooh, like have. That's really good. I just felt like something in my heart that was like, this is like good. Because yeah. before it just been like this, like, what, like, what is all this for? I like where like, I don't have that many shirts. I just rotate. I wear I wear a suit every day usually to school. I wear mm. a suit and a bow tie, and I have my wife and I share a closet, and m it is more mine than it is hers in terms of stuff, and that's always bothered me because mm. I think that there's some vanity tied up in that <laughs> mm -hmm. and and all of that. So I'm trying to I'm trying to get away from that. Mm. I, I was a weird uh, kid at one point in I think in middle school <clears throat> I was like I was watching Arthur and they were the same thing because they're cartoons right. and I was like. That's how you get a personality. You wear the same, you I have the exact same outfit. I like that logic. So oh. that never happened, but I thought about it. It's a good idea. I, I do wear, I have like three pairs of jeans. That is all that I wear when I'm not at work, though, which is nice. <clears throat> I choose my pants based on which one has a belt in them on the floor. Already in it? <laughs> yeah, that's really how I... From my days at the firehouse, when I take off my pants in the evening, I pull my... I pull my boots through, so I just have to step into my boots and then just pull pull Do them up. Really? Leave the belt That's in, leave cool. them around the boots. Yeah. Um, did you see this newspaper we started? Oh, is that for Chesterton? No, this is for oh, Pines. Oh, it's Pines of Aquinas. Yeah. I want to okay. give, give a little shout out here. Um, so we have started a newspaper here at Pines of Aquinas. It's called The Jill. And the reason it's called The Jill is it is a unit of liquid measure equal to a quarter of a pint. And this comes out quarterly. And uh, it's getting bigger and bigger. We're going to have it on newspaper paper next time. We have like Catholic comment, uh, comics, which I'll show you. It's really cool. Um, poetry, Catholic crossword puzzles. Can I write an article for it? Yes, you absolutely. Can I really? yes, yeah, please. You, I would love to write an article for it. But it, it, so these go for free to folks who become local supporters. So if you go to mattfrad.locals.com and become an annual supporter, 
then you can put in your address in the pinned uh, article at the top of Locals, and you'll get the next Jill for free, and we pay for shipping as well. Even if you live anywhere in the world, we'll pay for shipping. Just go to mattfrad.locals.com. You get a bunch of free things in return. We have audiobooks that come out every month. We have Father Gregory Pine, who hosts Spiritual Direction. Uh, every month, uh, just for our locals, um, we, we do morning podcasts. By John Henry Spann. We have a guest article from John Henry Spann and an upcoming Jill. But yeah, I'm really proud of it. Um, I don't like that paper. That was the first one that came out, but it'll be on newspaper paper. Can we? Trent Horn's got an article on the new one coming out, and hij- it's not available anywhere online. We're not doing a PDF of it anywhere. Can I hijack everything you're saying right now? Yes. All right. So Neil, are you on me? Can you zoom? Can you zoom in on that camera? <laughs> can you zoom in on this picture? I can't zoom in. Can you? Can you zoom in? Here, I can. I can just put it really close to this camera. That works better. Is that good? Oh, that looks great. Is that centered? <laughs> it's so blurry. Can I see Matt? So All right. So this is important because you said to me mm. on this show, or no, off offline, you said to me when we were texting that you were about to get rid of your beard. Yeah. You? I do want to talk about that. I feel All like right, the people need it. to. Go for it. Need to need to know that. Um, and you said you were getting rid of your beard because your wife didn't like kissing you, right? Because of your mustache, right? So you said that your options were to go Amish and just like shave the mustache, <laughs> or to get rid of the whole thing. And I think that I, I want to put you on the spot, and yeah. I think you need to like. I don't know if there's a poll. I don't know if there's a comment section, something. But I think I think the people deserve a voice, mm-hmm. Matt. Am I kissing any of these people? Should I be? <laughs> I hope not. Uh, no, but it's. Uh, I, I am all about the beard. I think you look like Tsar Nicholas II. Uh, and if, you're, mm. if you're listening right now, pull up Tsar Nicholas II. Very put together. Got a great, great mustache going on. Great beard combo. And uh, well, to, a, uh, credit to my wife. <laughs> it, at no point has she said like you need to shave the beard. Mm-hmm. It's just that when we kiss, she has a conniption fit because right. she has very sensitive skin. So it, it's always been this like, what do I want? You know, do I want beautiful intimacy within marriage? <laughs> Kissing means a lot to her. Sure. Or, <laughs> or do I not? What do I want a beard so you can think I look cool? And honestly, I'm not sure. I love that. <laughs> Thanks, brother. I'm not sure. So I told you what, because my wife didn't love the beard, right? I grew this this beard. The, the last time I grew a beard, right, through this beard, right? The, the beard has continued from this point. I've grown a beard a few times in the past. But the most recent time I grew a beard and decided I wasn't going to shave it was COVID, right? Mm-hmm. And I know because my I've got a picture of me on a turkey hunt that I was on during COVID where I have the beginnings of this beard. And my wife said to me something along the lines of, you know, I just I miss your face. I want to see your face, mm-hmm. and you're you know, you're handsome, and you look, don't look as much like the guy that I married. And I love my wife, and I'm a sucker for what my wife says. Like I am not some big throw my weight around kind of guy. My wife is, um, she is meek and humble and beautiful. She's but like, you know, she she says, hey, I want you to jump, and I say, okay, babe, how high? You know that kind of thing. Uh, but I did say, babe, <laughs> light of my life, mother of my children. Right, um, the the one woman who I'm sacramentally bound to, I'm called to die to myself for. The beard's not for you. The beard's for the boys. <laughs> <laughs> Matt thinks my beard looks cool. A bunch of sixteen year old high school boys think my beard looks cool. So I gotta have the beard. You know what a straw poll is? No. It's just like a website where you can make a quick poll and people can vote on it. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. It is in the chat, really. Here, and <laughs> here you can it, pin that. Here, I can pin that. Do you want me to, to just top. hold this up to me the rest of the time that I'm talking, <laughs> just so everybody can see? All right, see so I just pinned the 11 year old the straw poll to the top. Thanks for doing that, Neil. You should uh, open it too on the browser so we can pull it up. So yeah, I'll, I'll, pull, I'll pull it up now. I'll open it if I can. Here we go. All right, should I shave my beard? <laughs> By a guest 49 seconds ago. Yes, shave it so I can kiss my wife. No, keep it so I can be successful in life. I feel like you're really tipping the scales there, Neil. But let's see. I'll just refresh. So I, I guess oh, I have to... Have v- feedback? No, it's live. Am I gay? Why is there a gay test on this uh, Okay, I've seen poll? the gay test on YouTube all the time, and I'm glad you see it because I was worried that it was somehow <laughs> driven by my search history. Um, all right. Well, well, we'll skip the gay test. No, oh, so I just click results. Yeah. All right, so we've already got people. No, keep it is the majority, but people say, yeah, we get 24 votes now, 26 votes, 28 votes, 20, 30 votes. 
I wish we. No, could... I'm going to keep saying this. <laughs> 32, <laughs> 32 I wish words. we could. I wish we could break it down by male and female. Because I am curious. Actually, about why don't that. you put this up on screen, Neil, while we're just chatting? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's live. Updating. It's live. Right so, can you see that now? So, is it in the middle of the two of us chatting? No, it's. Uh, you guys are smaller. Okay, <laughs> that's kind of cool. So yes, yeah, shave. No, I can give it. No, that's good. You got to be shocked that it's so even, though, aren't you? That's why I'm interested in male and female. Well, because we, I talk to a lot of like women whose husbands have beards, and some will say, "Yeah, I love the beard, I yeah. love it." But I've talked to a lot of them who have said something similar, right? Like, and it's never my husband looks horrible with a beard. It's just I miss your face. Yeah, like, I miss yeah. You. My my wife will actually say, like, sometimes I look at you and I I don't recognize you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because I I never met. I didn't little, meet you with a beard. Yeah. So. Yeah, I like uh, beards. I'm on team beard. All right, I want to I want to throw something out. Is Ben Shapiro still growing a beard? I noticed uh, a couple of weeks I ago I went online. He was like growing some stuff. It was a, is my beard better than Matt Walsh's beard thing? I saw like a little oh. short that he had posted, and he just had like a barely like a uh -huh. stubble thing happening. But that's going to be hard if you're doing a daily show, right? To have uh, everybody see the ugly stage. I like it. I'm a big. I'm Look a, at this. I'm a There's so many guy. votes coming in. Oh, I don't want to want to talk about about beards. Mm -hmm. All right. We were talking about this. The other, uh, we might have been talking about this this morning when we were getting a coffee. There is, I, I talk a lot about masculinity, right? I've got a ma uh, like a authentic masculinity series of talks that I'm doing at mm -hmm. a church coming up in a in a couple of months, and I I just talk and think about that a lot, That's awesome. right? And when a lot of times when I when I do it, I feel like my brand or whatever you want to call it, right? I wear a lot of flannel and I have a beard and I talk about hunting and yeah, guns yeah. and I drive a pickup truck and all these things that are sort of traditionally masculine. And I feel like there's confusion all the time. I'm constantly saying this to 16 year old boys uh, who I, who I work with, not just ones on the street, but and the idea that masculinity is tied to the things that you wear and the things that you own and consumerism things, yeah. right? Like buying the truck or buying those guns or having mm -hmm. a sticker that just says, I'm a badass or whatever that means. You've all seen those. Yeah. Whatever yeah, the yeah. sticker means, what it really means is I'm really cool and manly mm -hmm. on the back of your car. Uh, I really like those. a lot of those things. I don't have a stupid sticker on my car. But none of that actually has anything to do with my masculinity. I think it's only right. coincidental. And in fact, I think that the reason I do a lot of those things is because when I was a younger man, desperately trying to figure out what it meant to be a man, I bought into those lies. Hmm. And so I started to try to frame myself around these things. Now, I really do like those things. I enjoy hunting. I like guns. I really like having a pickup truck. Yeah. Uh, but I think a lot of those are holdovers from a desperate attempt to be a man when I was younger. That is such a beautiful, vulnerable thing to say. I love it. I also love what you're saying too. Like, it's not that it's a charade. It may have been mm. in the beginning, but then you kind of came right. to love, love those things. I think I said to you earlier that and I've mentioned it a few times, like several years ago when I first read Dostoevsky, it was so that yeah. I could be interesting. Like right. I wanted to be the kind of person who would actually enjoy Dostoevsky. And that was really the primary reason I did it. It was pride. I wanted right. to say, to be, oh yes, I'd like to read some Russian classics. Mm -hmm. But then I actually fell in love with Dostoevsky. And so it's not like it's a charade we, now. We were talking about that last night on the way to the taco place, right? About how uh, sin, right, pride mm. and vanity and all of these things are part of human nature. And we can we can almost use it in our favor in a way, right? I want to like poetry. I want to be the kind of guy who reads poetry. Yeah. And But I don't really. I would much rather watch YouTube. I would much rather, you know, I don't know, go outside and shoot skeet in the backyard or go do there's a lot of things I would rather do than sit down and read, you know, Wordsworth mm -hmm. or something. Uh, but I've started to do it and it's similar to my relationship with coffee. Yeah. Right. Uh, I stopped drinking soda because I was one ham sandwich away from a heart attack. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> and I started to drink coffee for utility and I didn't really like coffee. I just started drinking it because I wanted to, I needed to be awake and I needed to, uh, to function in the morning and that little caffeine boost helped. And, that has been, I don't know, four months, five months. And over the past four or five months, I've gotten to where I really enjoy coffee. And I'm learning, well, actually, I like my coffee with, with a little bit of cream mm -hmm. um, or, oh, I like the latte better or maybe a little bit of this or a little bit of that. And this roast is better. And now I'm getting into the intricacies yeah. of coffee and I'm enjoying getting into those things. Whereas six months ago, I, I was like, yeah, co yeah coffee. So, so you had to detach from something less healthy that right. wasn't good for you, ultimately. Right. 
in order to start to enjoy this thing that you don't actually like. And likewise, you have oh, to yeah. actually make yeah. a decision, maybe to withdraw from YouTube or something, to then read a book. It's right. not like the two can ex coexist all the time. Well, you walked up to me in the airport. The first time I saw you was in the yeah. Atlanta airport, and I said, I am Ozymandias, yeah. um, king of kings, behold my mm -hmm. works, ye mighty in despair, right? Yeah. And I was like, I'm so proud, because I just sit, yes. down, sit down, I read this poem like four times, and I really got into it, and I enjoyed it. And it was mm -hmm. an awkward thing for me to yell to you across the I loved it. terminal. Yeah. But I've gotten to where I'm really starting to enjoy some of these things, mm -hmm. right? And it's... It's also speaking on masculinity, I think it's so ridiculous that we view things like poetry as not being masculine, as if there were anything uh, immasculine. Right, right. Because there's something feminine, but feminine, right, in a in a very good in a good way, right? Because mm -hmm. um, I want to make it clear, like girls should read poetry too. But <laughs> we we act as if there's something immasculine about reading yeah. Shakespeare. Well, I said to you last night, I think the most masculine man I've ever met is Brian Foley, mm -hmm. and. Yeah. Who I met for the first time. Yeah, doesn't wear flannel, doesn't have a pickup truck, has a nice car, you know, likes to read. And the first words out of his mouth when I met him was, Matt will never make money with a cigar bar. Yeah, yeah. well, we'll like see. The third words, yeah. <laughs> Find out tonight, yeah. 7 o'clock, grand, grand opening. grand <laughs> opening. Do you mind passing me that newspaper? Because I want to... Do you want to hold the picture of you up to the camera? No. More? But even if you don't want me to do this, I'm going to. There's a poem I put in here, and I love it. It's not mine. I wouldn't ever Is do it that. an original I would never do that to you. No. It's by Edgar... No, I mean, is it like a, is it a contemporary poem? Did no. I recently write it? No, it's not. It sounds like it may have been written a hundred years ago or so, but I actually don't know. Edgar Allett, Albert Guest. I don't know how old he is. I don't know. Feel free to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> Edgar, I could look it up, but Edgar Albert Guest. All right, listen to this poem. Tell me if you really like I'm it. Pumped. What I love about this poem is it's, it's in no way pretentious. And if people like are open <clears throat> to liking poetry, I think they'd like this one. He died in 1959, so it's older than 1959. Cool, thank you. He says, The happiest nights I ever know are those when I have no place to go. And the missus says when the day is through, tonight we haven't a thing to do. Oh, the joy of it and the peace untold of sitting round in my slippers old with my pipe and book in my easy chair, knowing I needn't go anywhere. Needn't hurry my evening meal nor force the smiles that I do not feel. But can grab a book from a nearby shelf and drop all sham and be myself. Oh, the charm of it and the comfort rare. Nothing on earth with it can compare. And I'm sorry for him who doesn't know the joy of having no place to go. Yeah, that's very good. It's delightful, isn't I like it? That. Yeah. It reminds me of um, I had a friend in college who who died tragically, actually. A friend of mine, Kevin, Kevin Sennett. And he used to say that what he wanted to do when he grew up was to be a man of leisure, mm. right? And it sounds lazy, right? But he said, but he would if you would get him talking, right, and have a couple of beers and be sitting around and talking about what that means, yeah. he would start talking about all the great thinkers ever, right? Yeah. The Greeks and you know yeah. all these guys who what they did is they were they were men of leisure. They sat around, they had conversations, yeah. and they they read things and they thought about things and they talked about. That's things. right. That's what I want. And that's what we that's what we should strive for, right? We should work. For the sake of living, not live for the sake of working. That's right. Our weekends don't exist to recharge us to go back into the office on Mondays. That's exactly right. We go to the office on Mondays so that we can have that time that's actually important. That's exactly outside. right. And even with me, you know, I, I'm <clears throat> I'm involved in this incredible school, and I do I, I work with some apostolates and ministries. I do a lot of I do a lot of work, and that's good. They're all good things. I really love it. I love my job. I, I love the things that I do that are work. But it's not my vocation. Mm. Right? It's not my primary vocation, which mm -hmm. is my wife and my children. And that's really hard to to realize. I just I was reading a book on the airplane called Leaving Boyhood Behind. Mm. I forget who wrote it, but um, Anthony Esselin, who I, I love, Anthony Esselin. Mm. He he read a book. He wrote a book not too long ago called uh, Defending Boyhood. And it was like Defending Boyhood followed by Leaving Boyhood Behind. And in the book, they were talking about how disordered. So many of our, our boys' understanding is in regards to our modern, <clears throat> and I'm not knocking capitalism, I'm not m knocking Western civilization, but sort of a Protestant work ethic sort of culture, and how that distorts us to where when you're really good at your job, we tend to retreat from that in a way that makes us less of a man than Mm. working it's great to be good at your job mm -hmm. but if you're retreating into your job what you're doing is yeah, to you're, escape from you're your making vocation. your life the hero's journey part without the important part which is coming back home at the end of the journey that's right and yeah. every day when you go out to work you're called to the hero's journey 
right? You're just like Odysseus on a much smaller scale of you're going to go out and you're going to self-sacrifice and you're going to do something for the sake of coming back home. Right. If you're doing it for the sake of like Bilbo, the journey itself. Like Bilbo and Frodo. Yes, exactly. They went, conquered, came back. And the reason that Lord of the Rings is so beautiful is they come back home. Mm. If it's just a continuing endless series of adventures that never is for a purpose and mm. never arrives back at what's most important, then the beauty's gone. Yeah. That's really great. Um, I don't know if you're open to this, but I think you're an excellent presenter, especially to boys, mm -hmm. like high school boys and college boys. Do you give talks more and more? I do. I've given some. Yeah. Could we, okay, so you feel free to say no, but could we put your email, that might be way too much, in the description if people want to sure. have you come and speak yeah, to- Yeah. Can we do it? Can we do it after? So I don't put my personal email in there. I need to pull up like my, hey, you want me to come talk email? Okay. Um, but I can do that. You're going to create one? I don't or? have that. Well, no, I've got one, but I don't have it off, off okay. hand. Okay. We'll like put some... that below. And if people want to reach out to you to come and give a talk, because yeah, I've, I've seen you speak to young men and you do a great job. Well, I really like it. I mean, I think, you know, there's that all that controversy right now with Jordan Peterson uh, and the uh, you know, him appealing to these, these young men who really have, like, our mm. young men are so left behind and told that their masculinity is dangerous and mm -hmm. that it's bad and that they're aggressive and all of these things, which, by the way, are, it, that's true. Like, you are, your masculinity does make you aggressive and dangerous in a really good way, and it needs to be civilized and moved forward. I talked about this last time on the show Well, a lot. what's interesting about Peterson is people will attack him for being that way, right. but then when he cries on camera— yeah. For being vulnerable. They're making fun of them for acting the way yeah. they say men should act. Yeah. Yeah. I've been thinking about this too because a lot of people, well, ever since I made that comment about there being no funny female stand up comics, mm -hmm. in my estimation, um, <clears throat> people, well, there was a few people who did podcasts saying how all of this cigar smoking and growing beards and things is uh, just this overcompensating. Yeah. And I'd love your thoughts on it, but here's mine. And that is a lot of people are able to turn their side hustle into a full-time thing now, mm -hmm. you know, maybe not a lot, but a significant number who never right. could have before can, myself included. But pints was this thing I did on the side while I had a full-time job and then it took off and I'm grateful to God for it. I don't have a boss now. Right. When I worked at Catholic Answers, they wouldn't have let me light up in their studio. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have let me talk about hunting in their studio. And fair enough. Good for them. I mean, they, they're trying to sure. do what they're trying to do. Now I don't have a boss. I can do whatever I want, mm -hmm. really, which is great. Um, and so now I can have a smoke on stage if I want. And I can talk about things that my employer may not have wished me to talk about. So I don't think it's a matter of, I mean, it might be the case that people are trying to uh, attach themselves to these sort of uh, uh, perhaps shallow forms of masculinity, but it also just might be the case that men happen to like certain things That's and are now a lot say. more free to talk about What them. you call shallow forms of masculinity, I think a lot of those are perfectly healthy and good yeah. attributes of masculinity that are not necessary, right? So there's a lot of things to, that, that, that make you a man, and then there's lots of things that you can enjoy that men tend to enjoy, mm -hmm. but aren't requirements for being a man. And you hear that a lot. You hear people talk about you're overcompensating or whatever because yeah. you're, do, you're doing all of these things when you're allowed to enjoy masculine things, and you're also not required to be bound by the politically correct police on all of your thoughts and, and opinions. So Laura Horn <clears throat> sent me something that was, Laura Horn is Trent's um, oh, wife. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. She's so cool. I forget what she said, but I just love this. Was this part of the fallout of the women aren't funny comment? Um, yeah, she was just terrific and just. But I watched it and you didn't say women weren't funny. No, <laughs> no. I, I think that. I think that women comedians tend to, I think that women tend to find women comedians funnier, typically, uh -huh. right? Because I think that's an experiential thing, and I think that makes sense. Um, have you got it? So I'm literally just stalling for time. Uh, <laughs> She's saying so many things I can't read because they're so inappropriate. That's how much I love her. Um, uh, yeah, and you know, it's what was actually interesting is this, uh, this psychologist who used to be a stand-up comic, this female... Oh, in Psychology Today. She that wrote one? an article defending sure. me. Someone shared it with me and I thought, oh gosh, here right. we go. But one of the things she pointed out was it's not just that, generally speaking, mm -hmm. men, I think, can command a room better. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you who's a great exception to that is the new uh, president, prime minister of Italy. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that was wild. Yeah, that she's was a really powerhouse. Amazing. Amazing. But what she also said was, and you, even, you could even look at this from a sort of secular point of view, 
and and not bring God or nature into it and just say, well, we're raised in such a way that when a woman is assertive, we're confused by it. Right. So you could even just demonize society if you want and still agree with me. Anyway, but what did she say here? I probably shouldn't have said that it was her. I'm trying to find something that I can read that's... But her ba- one of her points was like, you know, because she, she knocked these men. Oh, here we go. Um, she is so, this is what she said about a particular commenter on, on, on me. She is so insulting to men while claiming she's so insulted by one thing you asked with an open-ended question and made an argument for. Her, they can't attach to women or men and ate the trappings of masculinity was a low blow. Also, what are you supposed to do? Knit on your show? <laughs> also, if you didn't do these things, they'd claim you are, you all are feminine. She's so rude. Uh, yeah. But I just love that. I just love the point. It was like, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, cigars. I'm so sorry. Let's knit. Let's crochet. Would that be better? Or would we be aping women at that point? It's no, that's interesting. But it goes. So it's it's because it's the reverse of what the message was when I was growing up. And you said something yesterday, I think, tying this into the whole transgender thing. Right. Mm-hmm, exactly. When I was a kid and this would have been in the 90s. Right. The whole message was. Girls can play with Legos. Yeah. Girls can like fishing. Right. And Boys that's because are they to, can. Yeah. yeah. And th- that was right. I thought, yes. I actually, as I got older, thought that they took it a little too far with some of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, oh, no. Maybe you, they're trying to push girls into things that they right, don't typically exactly. enjoy. But now it's Now the it's opposite. like, oh, you like Lego? We should probably mm, mutilate your you body. You should have a double mastectomy when yeah. you turn 14 years old. Yeah. It's yeah. tragic. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it's, uh, it takes a superficiality... Uh, interests of men and women and just maximizes them and doesn't allow you to be a tomboy or to be a man who's interested in whatever things that are traditionally considered feminine yeah my uh it's far more narrow-minded like it's actually well my daughter the other day i have a i have an eight-year-old daughter i have two below her and then i have a 10-year-old son and my son and i were big into we, we go hunting a lot right and we've gotten to a point now which is really really cool where it used to be he was four years old and i would take him hunting with me and it made everything 10 times harder. And I enjoyed it less because, <clears throat> excuse me, because I was, I'm, I'm trying to be a good dad and I want to raise my son up and do these things. Mm-hmm. But he's gotten to the stage now where I'm super excited about him going with me. I can't wait to have him with me because he, not only does he help, he yeah. enjoys it. He's good at it. We're You're having good, good conversations yeah. and all of these things while it's happening. And so I started doing that with my daughter, my eight-year-old daughter, to see if she was interested. Because, yeah, yeah hunting is traditionally male. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, there there are girl hunters and there are girls who get into it. And it's a great excuse to spend time with one of the most beautiful people I've ever met, which is my my eight year old. I love her to death. Mm -hmm. And I took her out a few years ago, turkey hunting. And we sat in the blind. We put out some turkey decoys. I made some calls. We were there for maybe 20 minutes. And then she starts talking in a normal tone of voice, telling me that she's hungry and she wants to go inside (laughs) and all of these things. And so we did. And that happened a few times. Right. And so I sort of had thrown up my hands and said, all right, well, she's not. She is not really taking to this. So we're living in a rental property right now, and for the first time in the past seven years, I'm not raising my own animals to eat. Right? I'm not raising chickens this year for the first time in seven years, and that's bothering me. I don't like that. And so I've decided that I'm going to become a duck hunter. All right? So I've been looking for land to hunt on. There's a lot of public land nearby, and I've been going out. I mean, five-mile round-trip loops every day, pulling up a map, saying, all right, I think that's probably a beaver pond. Let's go find it. And my daughter asked to go with me, and I thought, okay. Yeah, sure. I'm going to take her, and we're not going to get anything done. The girl, three times last week, trounced over five miles through the woods, like looking at poop on the ground, like, Dad, is this duck poop? And looking at (coughs) helping me with all of these things. And I've seen her get really into it. And she said to me a few days ago before we left to come up here, she said, Dad, I really want to shoot a squirrel this year. Because that's the rule, right? You start with a squirrel, and then you get to go after a deer. You shoot a doe, and then we go after bucks, and then Mm -hmm. we sort of get... And it was the most heartwarming thing in the world. But I'm so bothered that she's grown up in a world where yeah. if she has a couple of tomboy tendencies, like she just won a trap setting contest at the trappers convention I was talking about earlier, where if we weren't in this community that we're in, people are going to say, oh, you like things that are traditionally male. Therefore, mm-hmm. sh- are you sure? Are you sure that you're a female? We had a teacher come and visit our school the other day who teaches kindergarten at a public school in Forsyth County, Georgia, which Gross. is pretty conservative north of Atlanta, suburban mm-hmm. area. And she said in their teacher training, they were learning about something called the gender unicorn. God they could teach mercy. to the fifth graders yeah. to help them understand that their sex and their gender weren't tied to each other. God have mercy. Yeah. So Sorry right. for rambling. No, it's, it's a good thing your children aren't being raised in a crappy school. So I don't God. think she'll ever feel that pressure. Can I, can I interview you? Can I ask you a question? Sure. 
So your son oh, yeah. just enrolled in a boarding school. Mm-hmm. Uh, St. Martin's uh, Academy in uh, Fort Scott, Kansas. So, and there's that, there's St. Greg's, there's mm-hmm. a couple of these pretty awesome, from what I've heard, yeah. boarding schools. When you first told me that you were going to send Liam to a boarding school, I was like really taken aback by it. I was very much like, oh, why on earth? Why would Most you people ever, mm-hmm. ever send your son out of your home? Aren't, that's what you do. You send your kid off to military school when there are serious behavioral issues, mm-hmm. when there's drugs involved. Why on earth would you do this? And it was only after I had a long conversation with you, but I also had a long conversation with our mutual friend, Mike Verlander. And um, I'm sure and the, he did a much better job explaining it. He did an incredible it. Of, yeah. of everything with lots of pregnant pauses while, while he looked at me and made me feel like my question was the stupidest thing I ever asked. <laughs> In a loving way. Yeah. I love that man yeah, dearly. Yeah. Um, and then another friend of ours who's sending their son there next year, not hmm. St. Martin's, but St. Greg's. Who's that? And, well, uh, don't matter. You tell yeah. me later. And um, it really opened my I still don't have any, feel any desire to yeah. send my, my son there, but I want to... I would love to hear the why you made that decision to send your young son outside of your home and across yeah. the country to live the way that I didn't live until I was 18 years old. Well, first, let me kind of explain to people what St. Martin's Academy and St. Greg's is. I've had a couple of teachers from St. Greg's on the show. I'm listening. I'm going to go get a water. Do you, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a, do we have a water? I think uh, it's just the Berkey. You might have to fill this cup up here. You might want to fill that up. Yeah, so, I mean, it's you hear boarding school, I don't know what you think, but I mean, like St. Martin's, for example, has about 60 boys in total. Are you still listening or am I just talking to... Yeah. (laughs) There's about 60 boys in total from uh, ninth grade to senior. They live on a 3,000-acre working farm, and there's no screens. Like, there's one phone that the boys use communally. Um... Uh, every Wednesday is a farm day. That's cool. So they learn to butcher animals. Do they not have any classes on Wednesday? No classes at all. That's it's cool. all farm work, yeah. They've got a couple of classrooms, but a lot of their studies are done outside in nature. The boys go fishing in the evenings. Uh, there's Latin mass uh, every morning. There's Eucharistic adoration a couple of times a week, but uh, it's only obligatory, say, like once. Um, all that sounds great, but why can't you just do that? Yourself. Okay, so... Sorry, I don't mean to grill you. I, no, no, it's okay. Well, first of all, I, I just trying to give some background so people kind of understand. We also <clears> sort <throat> of gave our son the option. You know, it was like, you know, like Cameron's feeling kind of sick, right? She gets really sick in the winters. And so we said, we're probably going to have to go south <laughs> for a month or so. So we sat him down and said, like, you can, you can homeschool with us down there, but I think you should give this a shot because I think you would absolutely love it. And he chose to go there and he's really enjoying it. Why did I send him there? Honestly, I think uh, it's probably because I think this school can provide what I can't. Mm-hmm. Which is what? Uh, well, farming things, woodworking, uh, uh, also the company of boys, that sort of stuff. So, I talk- like, I think you're probably in a much better place to raise your son and to educate him in some pretty cool things in a way that I'm not. Because I wasn't raised that You're saying way. just skill-wise and everything? Yeah. Well, and I'll say this too, just for, for anybody. And, and the other thing I'll, I'll say, sorry well, to cut you well, off. I'll just shut up. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, the other thing is, you know, like here, and this is kind of like the life of teenage boys, right? It's especially maybe they're homeschooled or even not. So if they're not homeschooled, they've got extracurricular activity maybe, and they're doing all these other things. Liam was homeschooled. And so we'd get the homeschooling <laughs> done. And then like him and his friends would like ride their bikes to Kroger and then like play Minecraft and then like play D and D. That's all really right. great. It's yeah. all fantastic. But it's a much more structured way of living where the boys wake up. I think it's five or six every mm-hmm. single morning. They work really hard. The boys are all working out together. They've got all these kind of yeah. free weights and stuff. Um, and he said to me, like, we go to bed and my, I don't, I just fall straight asleep because we're exhausted That's every beautiful. night. Yeah. So like, I think of like my childhood where it was like, I don't know, like Metallica and trying to make girls like me and porn and things like that. Um, and I think he's got a much more beautiful life than well, we could provide real. for him it's more here. Real. But just so people, you know, whatever they think, I don't care. But I mean, if he came home and was like, I can't go back, I hate it. Like, mm. okay, I'm like then we'll figure something else out. So Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I, and I want to say too, because yeah, a second ago you said how I was raised. And I, I wanted the same thing for my son. Because I, I think I had a pretty similar childhood that you did. I, I grew up in fairly rural South Georgia, but I lived in a town, mm-hmm. right? I had a sidewalk and... 
um, went to a went to a school ten minutes away, and I walked I walked to school and and some of those things growing up. And it was a fairly normal small town existence growing up. I got in a lot of trouble. I think I went over that on a previous episode, and ended up moving. But my my life was so tied up in just the the cheap and the inauthentic. 20th, 21st century nothingness of yeah. Western American culture, right? And I so desperately wanted my kids to not have that. Mm-hmm. But I didn't have that background. I mean, I I didn't get into hunting and farming and all of that until my early 20s mm-hmm. when we sort of made this decision that we, we need to live in a way that's better. I remember being so excited because from the time I was 15 years old, I always wanted to be a father. I wanted to be a husband. And I was doing all sorts of destructive, making all sorts of destructive decisions that were going to make it more difficult for me to be a good father and a good husband. Yeah. The scars of which are still mm-hmm. affect my ability to be the man that God is calling me and my wife and children need me to be. Uh, but I always wanted that. And I used to dream about the suburban. I wanted the cul-de-sac. I wanted the picket fence and dog and a bunch of kids running around. And then I got it. And it was just so unappealing. And I saw what my, and I'm not knocking. If you're living in a cul-de-sac right now, I'm not saying, oh, your kids are doomed, right? Or anything like that. But I I wanted something different for my kids. And it was my amazing bride who was willing to go from living in a very big, very wealthy area of uh, outside of D.C. to literally living in a double wide trailer with me in the woods. Uh, It was her and YouTube videos on Mm. raising chickens and Joel Salatin books on permaculture and all of these things where I just sort of decided I I want my kids to have a different experience. And Mm -hmm. so I really have to get out of my comfort zone. And I'm not Mm -hmm. patting myself on the back. It was totally my wife was as big of a driver as I was and other awesome people who were willing to help out. But I, I, I don't know how you could be. I don't don't know how else to live now. I'm just so enjoying Mm -hmm. it. We were house sitting last week. Like I said, and I had a moment where I walked outside, I was going to work, and I saw a bunch of boys playing cricket, right? Which is really cool. There are boys outside, but it's just sort of this weird sport that I'm not used to. (laughs) And as I'm looking at it, sort of contemplating this, what what are they doing? Because even Mm. I figured it out, but I couldn't figure it out for a little while. A robot uh, lawnmower drives by me, mowing the neighbor's yard. And I just had this dawning of like, oh, I'm not supposed to be. This is not my (laughs) my, my place. Yeah. I had this great analogy. I was taking care of the saltwater fish tank while I was there. And so there's all these fish, and they're in the living room, the beautiful, well-kept saltwater fish tank with coral and everything. And I had to do all of these things every day, or else they would all die. And I said to my wife, God wants them to die. (laughs) Like, nature doesn't want them to exist here. They're not supposed to be here. (laughs) I am those fish. (laughs) I feel like those fish. As the robot, or a Walmart is beside me while I stare at this weird sport that I don't understand. It's just like I am outside of my element 100%. Yeah. yeah. So I've ran Whereas back to the mountains. I respect uh, homesteading and that kind of stuff, but oh. I don't want to do that. I really like that I'm in a town with like seven families on my street who I know uh, where we, you know, I, I think, yeah, I think I'm good. I think being in a, I think being in a town is better than being in the sanitized HOA yeah, yeah. community. And yeah. once again, I'm not knocking that. I understand that's no, how I a lot of people live. Yeah. Um, but I think, but just for you personally, in a town where you can drive to the supermarket and you you know your neighbors, and it's just all about community. It's all about identity and culture. I want to uh, take some questions because these people were so kind to send them in. Um, think of this as the lightning round. Is that okay? Because there's a lot, and we want to try to get get through to them all. Um, Matt Spez, Matt Anderson <laughs> says, "Can Span come on Pines with Aquinas once a month? This is gold." That's nice. nice. See, I'm telling you, my Thanks, local Mike. supporters are terrific. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Big fan. Howdy. I'm a proud, currently in RCIA. Oh, no. I'm a prod. Protestant. I'm right. a Protestant, currently in RCIA. At the Easter Vigil, I'll be baptized along with my three boys, age six, four, and two. Heck Any yeah, tips brother. on raising Catholic kids that remain in the faith? Uh, give them an identity and give them a culture. They need to know who they are. They need to know what you stand for, and you need to be the expert on And they things. can't be like those fish in the pond that shouldn't be there. Right, And right. that's what it's like if you try to raise them in a... Yeah, but what, some of the best practical advice that I've gotten, I was just giving a talk. So I've, I'll do like a masculinity talk, and I've got one. I stole the title of our last episode that I've given a few times, I'll, Raising Kids in Sodom. Yeah. right? And one thing that I've heard a lot from young people, because I talk to a lot of college kids. I obviously talk to a lot of high school kids, but a lot of young adults. We have a lot of newly married couples over to our house. Um and so a lot of my, my advice isn't coming from things I think are good ideas, but things that, that these younger men are saying, man, I wish mom and dad had done this. Mm-hmm. One thing that always comes down to it is kids whose parents 
are too uncomfortable to talk about uncomfortable things or yeah. too awkward, those kids carry that wound with them for a long time. So the number of kids who come in, be it porn, be it girls, be it being a man, whatever it is, puberty, any of those things that make us feel a little icky. Yeah. If you're not comfortable talking to your kids or if your your talk is handing them a book and saying, you should read this, it's in there, mm-hmm. right? You're doing them a huge disservice because you, dad, or you, mom, need to be the expert on those things. Because if you're not the expert, they're going to ask the kids sit next to them in class mm-hmm. and that kid doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. And then all of a sudden they get these these disordered ideas of all of these things. Mm. And then the next time they have a question, they're not going to mom and dad because mom and that's going to be weird and uncomfortable. And no one loves your kids like you do, right? No one's responsible for your children's formation as much as you are. Um, I'm sorry. I know that this is a really slow lightning round. <laughs> uh, I, I was having a conversation with a man not too long ago who's he was an older man. And his children had left the faith. He had, was talking about his sons who had left the faith. And he was saying, these Catholic schools are failing, man. My kids, they went through all from the time they were in pre-K through, or, you know, preschool through, senior year, Catholic schools, they've all left the faith. And like the fact that he was blaming the Catholic schools for that, and I'm sure that they had something to do with it, right? Uh, but no, the Catholic schools are not the primary formators at all. We're a nice little supplement. I think we do an incredible job at my school. I think we're the best one. I would not send my kids anywhere else. But we're we're just a supplement. And if you're not doing it at home, yeah. then who cares what we do? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and to your point about culture, I think that is so important. I've said a number of times on this show that it's just a lot easier to raise a Catholic family in a Catholic town, uh, be that Steubenville or wherever else. I don't know if Catholics can continue to live the way maybe we did live 50 years ago where you're in a basically Christian culture. Now, in many ways, you, you aren't. Mm-hmm. I understand that sexual revolution, craps, sure. or trap on MTV, all that sort of stuff. But things like, just speaking personally, and this is not me trying to make people move to Steubenville, although we're having a ton of people move to Steubenville, including a couple from Hawaii who just moved here. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> they just it's, showed it's up. Pretty much and we're like, really? All right, cool. <laughs> As Peter Crave said, I'd rather you'd rather be in love in the Bronx than divorced in Hawaii, which is actually super offensive to people in the Bronx who are like, hey! <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> but, I'm um, divorced in the Bronx. Yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, um, you know, consider moving to a town where you can have a bunch of other people well, we're, come around you. We're going gonna to find identity and we're going to find culture in something. And it might be a nihilism and nothingness, which is what a lot of us do. It might be in the idea that we just need to be really friendly to each other and care a whole lot about college football or something. Once right. again, love football. But y- you need to let your kids know who you are and who they are because mm-hmm. they're looking to you they're looking to you for that formation for the time they're very little and it's such a stupid lie mm-hmm. that nowadays people say there's there's the real world that exists and then there's these, these little bubbles that aren't the real world as if humans haven't been in, living in close knit community with people of the same values and the same ideas since civilization existed that's exactly we're literally right. built to live in community yeah that's excellent. Yeah. Harry Clune says, how much does it cost to go trophy hunting? And are there any animals in the States that provide good practice before going trophy hunting? Yeah, uh, there are white-tailed deer in the vast majority of the United States of America getting out and getting out and getting in the woods. There's public land. America, the North American conservation model or North American model of conservation is one of the most successful models in the world. The United States and Canada have got all of this public land that's available. If you live in the 48 or Alaska right now, I'm sure it's Hawaii too. I just, I don't know. I've never hunted Hawaii. Um, you almost definitely have public land within a couple of hours drive that you own as much as I own, as much as Matt and Neil own, right? As, as citizens of the U.S. And you can go there and you can hunt there. And failing to hunt is... 10,000 times better for you than achieving something in a video game, right? Failing to do real things is better than achieving something fake. Succeeding in fake things. Right. Very Um, good. So, yes, deer are super prevalent. Ducks are super prevalent. I'm getting into that. Wild turkeys are super prevalent. Um, There's a ton of things you can get out there and do. You just just have to do it. And it's uncomfortable a little bit, but like reading poetry and like Mm -hmm. drinking coffee— do it yeah. because at, you will you will catch that bug and you will be doing something that is authentic and real and so good for you, so good for your soul. I want to go back because somebody just asked, uh, this is Kelly McLaughlin, what does a Catholic culture to raise kids in look like outside of somewhere in, 
uh, someone likes incredible like Supermobile, I have some idea, but any advice would help. So what I would say is it's much better to have two or three families yep. that you're close with than a hundred families you interact with. And so when I lived in Atlanta and you were there, right, there was like four or five families that right. we trusted right. that weren't giving their children smartphones that were good and normal and mm -hmm. wild and beautiful and yeah. loved our Lord. And we would spend a lot of time together. So I think it can be done. Um, but just invest in those people around you and make an intentional effort to do that. Well, I love how you said two additional families too, because it's really important for kids to see other humans who are not mom and dad, yeah. who are acting the exactly. same, who have the same yeah. values that yeah. mom and dad have so that you realize you're not by yourself and yeah. you're not the only people who are there. Um, Miss Julie Wilborn, who's a mentor of mine, I love that woman. You were saying, laughing the other day about how I, I don't shut up about how great I think this woman is. Um, she's got this great story about sitting in her living room with her daughter, who she homeschooled, mm. uh, look, and her daughter would look out the window every day at the school bus coming to pick the other kids up and say, like, we are so weird. Why are we doing this? And her mom trying to say, we're, we're not weird. They're weird. Like, yeah. this is right. And the reason why that ended up working out is because she found all these other wonderful families that mm, eventually became that our school. But she plugged her family and her kids in with other people to say, even though we are we are weird as an uncommon, we're living normally, being mm. normally how we're supposed to live, if that makes in sense. In a weird society. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brand Bob says, what is John Henry's best advice for a young couple who are pursuing marriage? How do we incorporate God into our relationship on a regular basis to lead to our marriage? Oh, my goodness. That's a good one. Um, I mean, these are always tough because I feel so much of it sounds cliche, right, about praying together and experiencing the sacraments together. This is, this is the best way I can sum it up. Cheesy, things that, are, that you think are cheesy are really wholesome, and that is good, right? So I was talking to a group of high school kids about this not too long ago, and I was talking about my wife and I's relationship mm. and how looking back and from sort of the modern standards, I mean, of the time for sure, especially of today, when we were doing things like praying a rosary together every night and like being careful about, uh, you know, getting engaged and like, well, we're going to make sure our feet don't touch the ground or I'm sorry, our feet always touch the ground if mm -hmm. we're on a couch or something together to guard each other's chastity. The kinds of things that we were open about and talking about, it sounds like a Veggie Tales kind of episode. It's like a cheesy Christian movie style relationship. But I think I'm only calling it cheesy because I've been I'm a victim of the indoctrination of our culture where I'm saying this is cheesy and campy and weird when really what it was, it was wholesome and good and beautiful. And I, I like that. I've been saying that a lot. Cheesy is wholesome and wholesome is good. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah I think uh, this, this cheese stuff is a result of cynicism. Like one thing yeah. I noticed when I was in Uganda is it didn't like, it was like they didn't have this language for cheesy. Mm -hmm. uh, there also wasn't sarcasm. I think oh, sarcasm nice. yeah. and ch calling things cheesy is somehow a result of the cynicism. Sure. You haven't thought that through, but... I love that. I love how you said that. Yeah. Cool. Uh, let's see. Um, Mike Mike says, do you and John Henry have suggestions on how to help your spouse overcome things like over scrupulous faith, anxiety, or miscommunication? What about improving yourself with patience, being a better head of household or learning to better approach conversations with your spouse? Yeah. Oh, over scrupulosity is something that I talked to a lot of people about, and I struggled with in a big way Did for you? a long time. I don't know if I've ever told you this. No. Uh, you know, Father Higgins down mm -hmm. in Christ Redeemer. I was in the confessional with him one time, and I was confessing all of these things. And about halfway through, he stopped me, and he said, none of these are mortal. I'm not absolving you. Go say an act of contrition by yourself. You don't, like, get out of here. And he kicked me out of the confessional. <laughs> and it was really good. It was really good as sort of this, like, smack in the face of, you know, God's not a tyrant. God, God loves you. He is not because I don't know what this is about. Says about my own upbringing and my own outlook. But I have always identified much more with Old Testament God. I get it, man. The justice and the mm -hmm. burning cities to the ground and everything, and that's easier for me to connect with, right? The justice is a lot easier for me to understand than the mercy because I feel like I don't deserve it. Mm. Um, and in my own in my own life and in my own marriage as the head of my household, right? Because it is an ontological fact if you're a man and you're listening to this, if you're a father, ontologically speaking, by your nature, you are the head of your household. It doesn't matter if your wife acts like the head of your household. You are. And that's politically incorrect. And going back to what I said earlier, that doesn't mean you need to throw your weight around and everything, but you are the one who you 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 are you are the leader and you have to lead because if you don't, it's going to be leaderless. 
right? If, the, if, if your wife, who's not the head, is leading, there's disorder in the household. Mm. And I think that's super uncomfortable because we've been indoctrinated to hate our masculinity and hate, hate our role as head, as priest, prophet, and king, right? The line of Melchizedek, all of you. Mm. So I don't know how practical that advice is, but it is true. And it's worth knowing. Yeah. Uh, Katie did it, says, can you share ideas on how Catholic men can encourage lukewarm or lapsed Catholic men to step up and be men of faith, leading their families? That's a good follow-up question. How Catholic men, can you read it one more time? Uh, can you share ideas on how Catholic men can encourage lukewarm or lapsed Catholic men to step up and be men of faith, leading their families? <sighs> Yeah, and I, I might I might punt that one over a little bit to you because my own my own experience I didn't have a I, I didn't have a lukewarm Catholic face right I went from agnostic mm-hmm. atheisty to burning on fire way too scrupulous mm. all of these things jumping into the faith with both feet to trying to temper that down for the sake of my 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 spouse and my children and being a a regular human being who can connect mm. with people. I think that I think that that men are so drawn towards that fire and that intensity. You know, I got a lot of uh, got a lot of crap last time because I said I would rather my son join the Taliban than be just a nothing lukewarm person because at least that fire I understand and I can and I can work with, um, even though it's horribly directed fire, mm-hmm. right? It, it, but there's still a passion and there's still a burning there, and that's so good. Um, in terms of bringing it out. I think we have to remember that we want to, as men, burn for something. And I think that mm. the, the, the passivity the and local the football luke- team. Warm, right, right. The luke- we'll warmness, burn for that. Right. It's is coming. It exists. It, it is so unnatural. And it's probably being manifest somewhere else, like towards football, yeah. like towards Marvel or Star Wars or something like that. And I'm not knocking Marvel and Star Wars. I feel like I have to say that over and over sure. and over again. Uh, because I don't want people to say that everything that is that is not tied directly to the faith in some way is weak. But C.S. Lewis, back to C.S. Lewis, he has a really good quote, and I'm going to butcher it. But the quote is on, he's talking about masturbation, he's mm-hmm. talking about pornography. And what he's saying about it is that we're all born in these prisons of ourselves. Mm. You, know, you know this quote? Yeah, I do. And masturbation points us more and more it, inwardly. He says it retards the process right. of our coming out. Because becoming a man is coming out of yourself for the sake of other things. Mm. And in the way that pornography does that to our sexuality, I feel like an overemphasis on football or an overemphasis on certain action movies or comic book movies or whatever it is, what you're doing, whereas pornography, you're watching other people have sex, right? You're watching this good part of you, this desire for connection, this desire for love, this desire for physical intimacy is being directed right back in you while you watch somebody else do this good thing, but perversely, right? When you're watching, when you're tied up in action movies or whatever, you're living vicariously through these people and not actually doing the good things yourself. Going back to it is good to fail at real things than Mm. to succeed at fake things. Oh, that's excellent. So I think you got to figure out what what it is that they're what it is that they are burning for, and then how to redirect. And also, if that's a female asking that, it is. I don't think that I don't I don't think that women can I don't think that women can push the men in their life out of that. Just like with mothers, right? There comes gets to be a time when I'm already seeing this with my ten year old when he wants to rely less on mom and he wants to be more like dad. Mm. And eventually he's probably he's going to want to push away from both of us to this for the sake of becoming a man in his own right. Um, I think good men and getting good men in their lives, not as children, because it's not infantilizing. I need good men in my life. I mm-hmm. said this earlier today. Yeah. When I saw you, right, outside of St. Luke's Catholic Church in Dahlonega, Georgia, 10 years ago or whatever, I was attracted to you. Mm-hmm. Not romantically, not not sexually attracted to you. You're a good-looking guy. But well, this is the, I mean, you go. You finish your point and then all. No, but I, but I was attracted to that because we mm-hmm. are attracted to to members of the same sex in a way that we want to be friends with them and we want connections yes, with real yes, strong yes. good people. So putting real strong good men in their life. Well, just like trans, this transgenderism movement kind of flattens out our interesting personalities such that a man can only like traditionally manly things and a woman can only like traditional female things. It's like the gay movement makes it uncomfortable to say, of course men should be attracted to each other. Right. Like, why else would you be a friend if you weren't attracted to somebody? Right. I think the other kind of ingredient for good friendships is that the two men have to respect each other, even for different reasons, where it's like, I want to be like you. 
Right. E- even if it's in different aspects. Um, so I guess I would say to this, uh, Katie, yeah, I don't know. Uh, there might be a men's conference he could attend. There could be videos online that you think he might resonate with. Uh, I know apologetics is something that men sometimes relate to and can get a lot more excited about. Well, I've talked to so many guys who are converted. They have conversions of the mind before they have conversions of the heart. Mm. And while a conversion of the heart and that desire for uh, for, for Christ and salvation, obviously, is what, what we're after. Um, attacking the mind of a man is often the better way to go about it. Crystalina Everett's conversion story, which is so beautiful. So beautiful. I have my kids watch it every year in my Theology of the Body class. She's lovely. But she talks about how her mom told her, like, you really need to go to this thing. You should really go. Mm. And she says, okay, I'm going to go for 15 minutes and whatever. That's right. It ends up changing her entire life. And that doesn't stop after high school. That doesn't stop after college, right? Going to those things and hearing those things that are really speaking to the heart and the truth of what makes us human, regardless of your stage in life, I think can really do it. So yeah, men's conference. A um, we have a group at our school called Patriarchs. It's just a men's group where they sit around and they they talk every week, mm. and it's amazing. Hear the stories. Yeah, I, I, we've started a men's group among some guys here in Steubenville, <clears throat> and I'm excited about the way we're doing it. I got to say because. It's very low key. All we're deciding to do is every Thursday morning at 8 a.m. we meet. And if you can't make it, you can't make it. Right. We're not trying to kind of like force intimacy or force sharing. It's mm-hmm. like, what if we just got together? Because yeah. life's busy. We have kids. We run in different circles. What if all we did was meet every Thursday at 8 a.m. and had a coffee and there was no pressure for it to be this like deep, profound thing? Right. And I like that because I think that a lot of the times... <clears throat> or most of the time friendship is forged, it's through boring encounters with each other. It's not necessarily through these highly intense... Right, through an Exodus 90 group or something like that, yeah. which I love. I'm yeah. all about some of those, those yeah. things, but there's almost the pressure there of I'm running a race and here's the end. It's my accountability group if I'm yeah. struggling with pornography, or it's my Exodus, Exodus 90 group if I'm trying to grow in this way. Uh, and it's almost... I, I went to a talk not too long ago called Goals Are for Losers. That was the name of the talk. <laughs> and he tempered it. I'm not saying goals are necessary for losers, but the yeah. idea is if you're so goal-oriented, you're missing the forest for the trees every single time, right? Um, or I guess you're missing the trees for the forest. Mm-hmm. And you're missing those those real mundane moments that are beautiful and much more impactful than the end game, the thing that you're trying to achieve. Sometimes, yeah. Uh, final question. This comes from Joe mm. Parisi. What are your views on homesteading? Mm. I love it. And I understand that it's not feasible for everybody, but for the past seven years, and we're only on a little hiatus right now because we're renting a house while we build our new house mm-hmm. and our new barns and everything. Um, but for the past seven years, we have not bought any animal products, right? We have meat chickens, egg chickens, turkeys, ducks. Dairy goats, I hunt, we have bees, barn cats, dogs, we've sold peacocks, we've done all of that. And I did that not knowing how to do that, not knowing how to get into any of that. It was me and YouTube and my bride, mostly for the sake of my children, but it's become something that I'm really glad that I did for myself. Was there ever a point where you thought, okay, I'm, I've bit off more than I can chew, I'm going back? No, but I think it's because we, we purposefully didn't bite off more than we could chew. We started with chickens, which are a gateway animal. I think, you know, you get chickens and then that's really easy. Well, turkeys are just big chickens. Oh, that wasn't too bad. We've already built this infrastructure. We could put goats where we had the turkeys last year and move the turkeys over here. And it grew fairly organically. Uh, and I've, I've loved that. Mm-hmm. I, I thought I was doing it for my kids, but it's been great for me. I bet like many things in life, our view of how things <clears throat> ought to look is the obstacle to actually doing right. them. I'm sure that's true of many people who they think about homesteading. <laughs> they imagine what it will be like. What's, what do you think there, the disconnect there? So I, I, had a, I had a girl one time who was farm sitting for me. We were out of town, and so she was going to come over twice a day, feed and water the animals, all of this stuff. And her, what she thought it was going to be was green acres of rolling hills with some beautiful cows being pretty yeah, out there. black and white and cows. And what it was was just feces up to your <laughs> ankles and shoveling, like mucking out goat houses mm. and all of these things. But I think that the, I think all the frustrating things about it you know, I didn't mean to make this a theme, but to go back once again to failing at things that are real is better than succeeding at things that are fake. Excellent. Even the even the tragedy, even when you had the the baby goats were born and one of them died, or when you had the um, well, I did all this work and then I had a coyote that got into my turkey house and maimed all my turkeys the other day, uh, mm. or any of those things. It just it's the difference between working as a 
sort of white collar salary employee and an hourly construction worker where the hourly construction worker at the end of the day says, man, I did things today. I did real things today. And I'm a white collar guy. So I, I get the white collar world and why that's important, the service industry and all of that. But uh, I think the, 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 the muck and the ugly and the dirty is so real and beautiful and in such contrast to how we're told we're supposed to want to live. And it's so much more fulfilling. Yeah. And plus you're not dependent, right? You're dependent on yourselves. Right, you're dependent on you and your family. That is cool. Sweat equity is a beautiful thing. Would you ever want to live uh, on a farm, Neil? Is there any kind of desire yeah, or something? I, mean, <clears throat> I think that there's things about like the modern, even suburban world that I really like, like you know, fun restaurants, sushi places, things like that. Right. Um, but I don't know. I'm really interested in just you know having a greenhouse, growing my own like peppers and stuff. Uh, Yeah, I think at a certain point, it's like what I want to do with my life isn't spend most of my time like working with animals and things. So I right. don't know if I'd ever get like like a cow or something that's going to take up like more than half of my day. Sure, because I want to do other things too. But in terms of having you know a, a, you know maybe long list of chores and uh, you know just having chickens, maybe goats, you know something like that, I'm. I'm the chores are such a cool part, like having having these these kids and saying, you know, all right, well, if we don't get out and do this today, we literally won't have dinner tonight. <laughs> and it's done in a way that is, it's like there's the fallback, because we can always run to Kroger, right? We can always run to the supermarket at the end of the day if we have to. Uh, but we try to pretend like we can't a lot of times, and, and it's fun. And once again, I do think there's a, I forget who said this, but um, there's a great quote that says, Tradition is the democracy of our ancestors. Mm. And I think that there's really something to be said for the way things have been done forever are probably a good way to do things unless we have a good reason not to. And there's a, we can talk about the horrors of the past. We can talk about slavery and we can yeah. talk about you know, human sacrifices to blood gods of the Aztec, things that we shouldn't do just because we've done them. But I think just throwing out the agrarian lifestyle mm. and all of these things that we've been doing since humans have been civilized right i think there's something to be said for that and unless we know like a chesterton fence scenario why mm. we want to get rid of it i don't think we should be so quick to throw it aside that's excellent all right here's what we're going to do we're <clears throat> going to go over on locals so i want to record a section on locals awesome where we say things that youtube might ban us for okay. and then we'll also look at some babylon b articles together to get your <laughs> reaction sounds great so if you are a supporter on locals mattfrad.locals.com i'll also be posting this video on patreon we're going to record it and then upload it so we're not going to go live over there right now but we will put it up there shortly yeah, uh thanks for, thanks for coming on the show we're going to put your i want to put your email below if people want to book you to have a see if you're free even to give a talk uh, and then and we, check out Honest to God. Yeah, check yeah. out Honest to we're God. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on Spotify. Right. I'm sure we can throw a link down there somewhere. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Cool. Awesome, Matt. Thank you.